Yeah, welcome and hello everybody. We still have a few more minutes um, before we start. My name is Stefan Kaske. Um, I'm here at the chemistry department at Technical University Dresden in Germany. And I will be the moderator and organizer today of the webinar. It's my great pleasure to also have all the other speakers here. So just a short question, can you all hear me well? Um, there is a, a Q&A box for questions that you can use to say good morning. Okay, thank you, Charles, that's great. Thank you for the feedback. Uh, thank you for the, ah, Miguel, good to see you or hear you. Thank you for joining, great feedback. Okay, that's that's fine. Okay, super. So I think it is 11.30, so let's start. Um, it's my great pleasure to welcome you and um, introduce you to the workshop, Digital Adsorption Data Space. So this workshop was organized by the UPAC task group on the standardization of adsorption data and adsorption file. So here you see the IUPAC task group and you see also some of the task group members are with us already. Um, not all of them joined today, but we have some extra speakers also. Um, for example, Louis van de Fus and Paul Yakomi also joining and Sida Keskin also uh, joining and also Chimo Silvestre Albero also joining. Uh, some speakers are joining a little bit later, so uh, we're looking forward then to their uh, presentations. Um, you see also on the uh, slide here the web page. So this is the web page that can be also quite useful today for this uh, workshop. It's the workshop of the IUPAC task group. So uh, you can look at the different software and programs that are available there. And this uh, IUPAC task group has started 2021, was uh, granted. And today we are organizing this digital adsorption data space workshop. I will briefly guide you through the program. Um, after my introduction, I will um, hand over to Jack Evans from Adelaide, who will give some more uh, details about software available for uh, data transformation into digital formats. Then uh, Veronique van Spielberg and Louis van de Fus uh, will continue uh, to uh, address the aspects of theory and simulation. Then Siderius joined in from the National Institute of Standard and uh, Technology to uh, discuss problematic isotherm data and a quiz. And we also have then some more time for a deeper Q&A and, and discussion. And after that, we have uh, contributed presentations uh, from various types of applications in the field of various different materials like porous materials, porous carbons, MOFs uh, regarding simulation, MOFs regarding experimental data, and then um, later also the data visualization with PyGap and then Darren Broom from Haydn will also introduce high pressure uh, data uh, treatment before we finalize our presentation with a contribution from Dan, uh, giving us some insights into the NIST adsorption database. So what's the motivation for this um, workshop? Um, adsorption technology is a key technology in our society. Um, we have today a lot of different challenges, uh, especially the environment, climate change are big challenges. Um, and the CO2 capture for all these technologies, adsorbents, advanced adsorbents are needed and new processes have to be um, developed. Um, of course, uh, adsorption technology also contributes to separation technology, um, which in, in, uh, uh, improves the energy efficiency of separation processes significantly. And last but not least, uh, least aspects like health, for example, medicinal oxygen is produced by adsorption technology, clean air and the recovery of elements, for example, for lithium ion batteries here also, adsorption plays a key role for the circular uh, economy. So on the other hand, also, um, yeah, a tremendous amount of novel adsorbents, zeolites, carbons, MOFs and COFs, are published today. Zeolites are optimized uh, as established adsorbents. New carbons are produced, but also new applications with uh, established carbons are um, uh, studied. And then, of course, more than uh, 40,000 different MOF architectures are published and COFs. Uh, mesoporous materials contribute to the understanding of adsorption uh, isotherms, and then also porous polymers are developed. 
However, it is more and more difficult basically to uh, predict which adsorbent is the right one for one of the processes that we need, for example, for CO2 capture or for clean air uh, production. And um, the, uh, the, the challenge today basically is to match certain adsorbent data with process requirements to advance um, the field. On the other hand, uh, today we have um, artificial intelligence. We have now tools like machine learning or the digital twin that is very powerful and allows us to predict which process uh, could be performed with a certain uh, material or which um, material would be suited for a certain um, process. And um, this would bring theory and experiment uh, very much uh, together. But for this, it's necessary basically to mine the data available in the literature <clears throat> and uh, to compare them, to evaluate them. And uh, one of the key challenges there is that the data are quite dissimilar. So sometimes they're published as plots in the supporting information. Sometimes they are um, published as tabulated data, but in many uh, cases, they are just graphs basically, which are um, published. And one of the key challenges uh, in the field of adsorption digitalization, the digitalization of ad adsorption data is the standardization. Standardization has to precede the digitalization because it makes much more data available and allows also to, uh, to use them in different types of applications. Applications. And um, uh, for example, this publication here very much emphasized the guidelines how we should prepare and publish data in the future. Um, data should be findable, um, they should be accessible, so uh, ideally open accessible. They should be also interoperable, that means that an understanding of the uh, formal and accessible shared and language uh, has to be uh, a unique language. And uh, this makes the data then also reusable so that old data can also be uh, reused and, and re-evaluated. Uh, metadata can be re-evaluated. And um, this is one of the, the great challenges also in, in many fields, of course, but here in the field of adsorption to guarantee this type of uh, data management. So many databases are already available, um, not so many on adsorption data. One of the prominent examples is uh, probably the NIST ARPA-E database for novel and emergent adsorbent materials. And uh, we will hear more about that uh, in, uh, towards the end of the uh, workshop. Of course, also other associations like the Inter International Zeolite Association provide a lot of data, in particular structural data that are available. And uh, the structural databases are probably more advanced as compared to the adsorption data bases, in particular the uh, crystal structure database from Cambridge, the CCDC. Um, and of course, this is not only limited to adsorbents, but contains a lot of porous materials that are um, available if, if they are crystalline. And then for specific topics like MOFs, for example, certain databases are available like Topos Pro, Core MOF database or hypothetical MOFs, the tobacco, tobacco um, database, and they can also be uh, accessed, but they do not directly communicate with each other in all um, the cases. So the challenges is of course, when we provide uh, these data, is the standardization. And one of the most successful uh, examples, in my view, is the Cambridge Structural Database um, operated by the CCDC software, which contains now over 1 million structures. And uh, it contains a lot of detailed information. Uh, crystallographic uh, information is quite complex information. And when you look at the structure, how the um, how this uh, data, how these data are provided, then you will easily uh, realize that it is uh, essentially provided in text format. Uh, it's a text format with different codings. So you see such a crystallographic information file, the so-called ZIF file, which co contains information like the, um, let me just take a, a pointer, uh, like the cell constant, so detailed information. And uh, from this standardized file format, it is then possible to redraw the structure, of course. Uh, it's a standardized information. Um, there's software available to uh, plot the structure, to in, 
extract further information, metadata, and then also there's software already available to check these file formats if they are um, if they are consistent, if they are self-consistent, and this is a quite advanced example. So the question is why this is not the case for adsorption data today, why adsorption data are not reported in such a standardized uh, format. And this is a publication from my own group uh, from 2009 when we published a metal organic framework, DUT6, Dresden University of Technology number six, with a very high surface area, a nice adsorption isotherm with the nitrogen uptake versus uh, P over P0. But at that time, we also published our data in this uh, linear format, basically. And uh, we only published a graph. And this is often the case. The uh, adsorption isotherms are published, basically, in a graphical format. Um, either in the supporting information or in the main part. And it is very difficult to re-extract the exact digital information from the adsorption isotherm, from the adsorption and desorption uh, branch, especially also in the low pressure region. So when you want to re-extract basically such data from uh, old data, then you have to digitize these graphs. And uh, this is an example of what happens basically um, in the NIST database when you digitize such isotherms and you see that the isotherm looks nice in the high pressure uh, region, but in the low pressure region, there's significant deviation basically from the uh, original experimental data that we of course also still have uh, available. And in this way, um, especially the data at low pressure, the Henry constant, and also the information about pore size distribution is lost. And in order to re-evaluate the data, uh, for example, do DFT analysis, this is uh, very challenging. So for this reason, um, the task group has proposed a, a new standardized file format, which will be also uh, detailed more in detail in the next presentation by Jack Evans. And um, this uh, file format basically allows you with a software uh, to uh, transform your isotherm, no matter on which instrument it has been recorded, into a text format, which contains all the um, data. Also, uh, you can also include metadata and um, also additional information. And this will be explained more in detail, basically, in the, in the next presentation. Um, so this uh, software is available on the uh, on the web page of the uh, IUPAC group. So we have different types of software packages which are available there. Um, they are uh, either uh, for download or you can also apply them as the web app. Here you see different formats from sample from different companies. And some of the companies are already uh, installing this software on their own machines. So SMS, uh, Surface Measurement Systems, and Haydn have already implemented the software on their machines so that you have an output option also on your uh, instrument, which allows you to transform the data basically into the, um, into the new text format and to, into this file format. And here this web app also allows you to visualize the isotherm. And we will also hear later in a presentation from Paul Yakomi, how the visualization can be improved and, and facilitated there. So the current uh, standard that was established by the IUPAC group, and uh, you will hear more about it in the next presentation, uh, it is now possible basically with this standard to submit your uh, valuable high quality adsorption data either as a supporting information of a publication um, to your uh, uh, publication or the second option is also you can submit, submit this uh, uh, adsorption information file, this standardized information directly to the NIST database um, as an attachment email to Dan Zedarius and the uh, database is also working on a more automatized uh, um, submission form, but at the moment you can directly send it basically to Daniel Sidereus to be included there. And these are the two options that uh, allow you to deposit basically your adsorption data in a, a very precise format. So um, this was already my introduction and I would like to close a little bit with the, the scope of the workshop. <clears throat> we do not only want to disseminate the 
um, the progress that we had in the IUPAC task group, but in general, the workshop aims to advancing the, the high quality digital absorption data management, um, to advance the uh, deposition of high quality absorption data that are then findable, accessible, uh, etc. And um, this workshop also uh, has the aim to bring together theory and experiment because also from the theory point of view, many isotherms are predicted and can be deposited in such a standardized format and then can be compared with the experiment. This allows to directly compare theory and experiment also after the publication by different groups and uh, will make much more information accessible for machine learning, for data evaluation, um, et cetera. And uh, of course, I should say that uh, this pro uh, project has started 2021 uh, and it's a continuous process. Um, it requires a strong interaction, intense interaction with users. This is also the reason why we are doing this workshop. So we also need input from the users. It's a dynamic process. Um, we also require input from uh, equipment manufacturers from other groups. And we are very open for the discussion here. Um, the discussion of other user demands and also challenges that uh, users may see. And last but not least, I think this workshop uh, will also bring together academia, industry, research institutes and uh, uh, scholars um, because this information is equally valuable for all these communities. So with this, I'm already through with my um, presentation and um, I would uh, like to hand over to the next presenter, um, Jack Evans. But of course, we have a few minutes time for questions. So if you have very urgent questions, um, then you can already ask them. I see already one question from David Danacci regarding the ARF co converter. Would it be possible to add an option for a gener generic CSV uh, file with two columns, pressure and loading? Um, maybe there's a question for Jack directly. Yeah, so we would really like to implement something like this, but it is a little bit more complicated than that because we really want information about units and the units of pressure, for example, the units of amount absorbed. Um, we also require some connection to uh, experiment at the moment, but we are trying to develop an online system, so you can just paste in a um, CSV or a column, column of data, so data of pressure, data of uh, amount absorbed, then click down buttons explaining what units these are, are represent. Um, that's something we'd like to implement. I believe there is a system through NIST for um, doing this to create a NIST JSON format, which is um, you know, equivalent to an AIF. Um, so so my short answer is it'd be great <laughs> the long answer is uh it is a little bit tricky because of those restraints on pressure and or restraints on units and trying to connect that to that information yeah i think that dan can probably <laughs> wait because there was a yeah there was a website right for somewhere you could paste information Yes, when, when I'm uh, presenting at the end, I will actually demonstrate a tool that, that is a bridge toward what David is talking about in terms of being able to just input columnar data. Uh, the, the problem, as Jack pointed out, is that the isotherm requires a, a batch of metadata to be fully descriptive. And if we have a CSV format that contains that relevant metadata, we're in a sense duplicating what AIF is going to accomplish. Uh, so, as a bridge, I would I would encourage us to use some digital tools that will will describe that can take us from that CSV data directly to AIF, while also retaining all of the rich metadata that's really necessary to describe the isotherm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we have one more question. Maybe we can keep it brief. Is the AIF available for dynamic flow gas system under atmospheric pressure? Is it available for gas mixture? Uh, this is probably a question for Paul, maybe. Paul, do you want to? Yeah, I believe Paul has been experimenting with this. And that is something that we're uh, working towards is the development of language and development format to describe, just as you, uh, you've asked, uh, 
um, separation information, so information of co-gas adsorption. Um, this should be available, or should it, our format is flexible enough to treat such experiments, but um, we are yet to nail down the exact specifics of how to do this. Um, our focus at the moment is being mainly on volumetric um, and single gas adsorption because that is uh, predominantly what is um, recorded um, in a lot of the literature. Um, however, I'm sure, Paul, you might have some insight to how you're uh, using this format to describe such experiments. No, you're completely, you're completely correct, Jack. We, we need to have a, a very good think of how this format can be extended um, to, to encompass these kind of multi-component isotherms or carrier gas type um, experiments. Um, but the format is certainly capable of doing it. Uh, we just need to iron out the last details. Great. Then I suggest we continue. So the next speaker is uh, Jack Evans from Adelaide University. Um, Jack, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Stefan. And thank you for your efforts in putting this uh, symposium together and really highlighting the work that our working group um, through the IUPAC has done to making this format uh, not just an idea from a paper years ago, but actually something that researchers around the world are using and something that we're hoping will um, uh, all researchers will one day use so that we can better describe some of the experiments we uh, perform and share these experiments with the world. Um, so I'd like to uh, wish everyone good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Uh, from wherever the world you are, it's currently uh, dinner time here in the uh, University of Adelaide in South Australia. Um, but science really no, knows no bounds, and I think this is really a, a powerful show of what um, you know the type of research er that everyone does around the world. And you know, this kind of format is a way that we can bridge uh, communication um, so that we can truly really share our experiments, our science to the entire world. Um, so in today's, uh, in my talk today, we're going to be discussing some of the ways we've been implementing uh, this universal standard archive file or, or AIF um, to describe adsorption data. And as always, if there's any um, questions you have, you can reach out to me on Twitter or through my email address you can find online. Um, there's a small group that we have uh, putting uh, changes and trying to update our format to, uh, uh, to really reflect the wealth of experimental data that's out there. So um, really it's this communication and the users are really what's going to push this uh, format forward, not the people, uh, I guess, putting together the dictionaries and putting together the format. So I think what um, Stefan described in his introduction was really the, uh, the, the reason why we came together to describe and propose such a format. And so this is the question that we were faced with is ultimately how can adsorption data be openly reported? And that's what we should always think about when we're doing an experiment or putting together information for a paper is that we want to make sure that there is no questions about the um, the measurements or any questions about the uh, science that we're presenting. We want that science to be widely accessible and widely reusable. And so there's a few ways that we can improve um, this in the absorption sense or in the, the, the uh, adsorption science sphere, it is that we should include our adsorption experiments as either tabulated data in the manuscript supporting information, or including that as um, CSV, even CSV files in the supporting information as well. And so just by doing these first two steps, you can imagine that someone can take that information that you have um, inputted or reported in your Manuscript or in your um, or in your research report, and can reanalyze that information to find something new or to put it in context with some of the experiments they might be doing. Right, so you may have the best um, material for CO2 adsorption, but 
um, if someone wants to try to improve that or wants to beat that record, um, how can we you know, use the same measuring stick? And I think this is what this format really allow, allows. And so these two ways, I guess, are really not um, perfect because we're missing a lot of metadata. Now, metadata is a word that can be thrown out around a lot in these um, talks. And metadata is really the extra information that we have about the experiment. So that's whether it was a volumetric experiment, whether it was a gravimetric experiment, um, how this pressure was recorded, what units of pressure are we using? These type of things are what we consider metadata. And so if we can encapsulate all this information into a data file and upload that, that is the perfect world. And so ideally our adsorption data file includes all that um, extra information, all that metadata, as well as the um, amount adsorbed um, for which pressure and you know, information about the temperature, et cetera. And so if we do that, we can have this um, idea and this format that we describe as this universal adsorption format. And so when we came to describe this universal adsorption format, we looked to other formats that are around in the, the world of science. And I think there's no greater format than the SIF format. Um, so Stefan already described a little bit about the SIF and um, gave the excellent example of the uh, CDC or the uh, CCDC, sorry, the Cambridge Crystallographic uh, uh, Crystal Center. Um, and it just shows you the wealth of information that um, research produces and by you know having just one format and housing that all into one place, you can, you can see all the amazing things that we can do with that. Um, and so, the crystallographic information file or STIF is the way that all crystal structures are, well, all single crystal structures and a lot of powder X-ray diffraction patterns are reported and, uh, um, and housed in this, uh, this database. And so the crystallographic information file has all the information, all this metadata about, you know, the uh, melting point of your, uh, of your crystal some of the creation dates. So when was this uh, crystal, um, or when was this SIF, uh, the file itself was created, and information about the cell dimensions and cell angles and everything you need to, everything you need to know to recreate this uh, three-dimensional picture of a crystal structure. And so this um, SIF format is based on this star file and you can see some of the, the syntax or the way that this uh, data is arranged within this file where you have some name here then you have um, something that is related to that here um, and so this uh, description is a star or, or is the star based uh, syntax system and in the star based syntax system we have these things called data names and data values and so our data names are the first part here. So something like underscore format is our data name. Then the data value is then directly associated with that data name. So in the case here, our underscore format is, give, is related to star file. So the format is star file. You can see this also in the uh, next line down where we have a underscore first underscore published as our data name and um, a value of 1991. So here you can see how we're connecting information from, um, yeah, we're connecting information to descriptions of that information. So we don't just have 1991 here, we have a data um, name that's associated with that. So we know what 1991 means. We know that that means that this is what is related to this idea of first published. And so this is what, um, yeah, this is the, the general syntax that star, um, that the star format uses. And no, it doesn't just allow us to describe single uh, strings. So um, the star file is considered a string, which is just letters, I guess, or words, um, or just numbers in the case of our first published, but you can also describe lists of information. So 
Here you can see by using this loop syntax where we have loop and an underscore, and then we have three data names here. Um, so the data names here are just a set of bond uh, sites. So the label of bond site of atom site one, the label of atom site two, and then our third data name being our geometric bond distance, so underscore geom, underscore bond, underscore distance. This allows us to describe three columns of information where the first is related to this first data name. So our um, atom site label one, the second being our second data name. So the atom site label two, and then the third being our bond distance. So you can see how using this loop structure, we can combine um, lists of information and lists of data values associated specifically with data names. And so this is all how it works in the SIF sense. And this is generally how the star syntax is arranged. And so what we thought and what we have used is we, that this star format is just a, a really flexible and easy way for us to describe a bunch of metadata and a bunch of data about our absorption experiments. So you can think of it as just a simple container for that information. Um, a well-formatted, well-arranged container, but a container that allows us to describe everything related to an adsorption isotherm as a single file. Um, and so it has everything needed to describe things like uh, the amount absorbed, pressure um, and temperature, and you know, all the things we think about when doing an adsorption experiment. So this is what a adsorption um, information file looks like. And so here you can see the advantage of the star syntax is that we can open it in any text editor. So I just opened it here in text edit, which comes with all um, Apple um, computers, but you could easily open this with notepad or any other text editor that you like to use. So it's just like a text file. And each line of the file, you can see a series of data names, data values, and then some loops. And the loops allow us to describe the adsorption and desorption branches. So you can see we have a few lines here that describe um, our experimental information. So you can see data names that are related to the operator, so the person who ran the experiment, the date the experiment was ran, the instrument, um, so just a string or some description of which instrument did this, a, a um, line relating to which adsorptive is doing the adsorption, <laughs> and um, the temperature of the adsorption isotherm or the adsorption experiment. So these are all lines, and all data names and their, rep and their corresponding values that we assign to um, experimental like uh, conditions. Then you can see we have a uh, few lines here that describe the adsorbent. So these are things like sample mass, the ID, so some kind of label that you give this, and then some a material ID. And so we use the material ID as a way to combine lots of information, where as the sample ID is more your label. So, um, you know, which batch is this, that type of thing. Then we have a bunch of lines here that describe all the units that are um, are represented within the data file. So the idea is for our AIF is there's no guessing needed that the file itself has all the information to, um, all the information uh, is labeled correctly and inherent in that one file. So it means that we don't have to guess what we mean by temperature as 77.3. We have it detailed here that the units of temperature must be Kelvin or R Kelvin in this case. So you could write it as Celsius if you want, or Fahrenheit, God forbid. Um, you can see here, we've also uh, described pressure as tor and uh, units of mass, grams, and the units of loading as center, um, cubic, center uh, cubic centimeters. Um, and then you see that we have a loop here where we describe the adsorption branch. And so you can see three data names that describe the um, adsorption pressure, the adsorption um, saturated pressure, and the adsorption amount. And so you can see that we have now columns of lines here that uh, relate to each of these uh, data names. 
and then we have the same for desorption. So clearly there are some advantages here that we're separating adsorption and desorption branches. So we can clearly see or clearly differentiate these two um, parts of the experiment. Okay. Now I've spoken a lot about the data names and I guess what is the important takeaway is that the idea of this universal um, system or universal format is that we all need to use the same data names. And so that we can do this or so that we do this, um, we, uh, um, and I guess part of the point of the I, our IUPAC um, project is to detail clearly what data names should be used. And we do this by creating a dictionary. And so if you go to our website, the adsorption information or adsorption information format.com and go to uh, specifications, you can see here a current, our current dictionary of data names and their um, associated description. So there should be no guessing um, what we mean by certain data names. Um, and the idea is that if you want to create your own, um, a file from scratch, which you're freely available to do. Um, if you use these data names, we can ensure that everyone can, um, you know, repass and reshare and read that information in the same way. Um, and just an example of how to use this dictionary, you can see that there's a search bar here. And so you can search specifically, we just recently updated this to include information about degas conditions or activation conditions. And you can see here we have informations that are related to the adsorbent, where we have a summary of degas conditions, a temperature of degas, or a time of degas conditions. And so you can see how um, you can completely describe, and I guess the goal of this dictionary um, is so to have all these data names, so you have everything you need to describe in detail, um, so there is no guessing, um, every part of your experiment. And I guess the important part of this is that this list is not set in stone like um, like uh, an old dictionary. Just like dictionaries today, we try to um, actively update this list based on um, discussions with you, the users, um, because what I think should be in the dictionary is probably not what you know you think could should be in the dictionary. So it is really this conversation and um, requests from users that. Uh, spurs on development of this dictionary. And you can see that, you know, we try not to update it too frequently because we want to keep consistency, but we're, um, we're open to, and, you know, based on feedback, we will update the dictionary to include information. Um, for example, on the, the way that we changed uh, information about activation to degas just to avoid any um, confusion and, just shows you that this uh, this list is dynamic and will change with time. But the nice thing is because we're including this all in our GitHub, we have revision notes and re uh, revision history. So we can always go, go back in time and see what the dictionary was at a certain time or anything like that. And so once again, you can see the, um, the dictionary at our GitHub. Um, and I, the, the nice thing is that there are lots of ways to put together an AIF uh, file or a, a, the, using the AIF format. And Dan Sedaris wrote a really nice instruction um, for uh, a adsorption special issue in uh, the Journal of um, Chemical Engineering and Data. Um, and feel free to use this as an idea of how to put together um, the file if uh, you don't want to use or if you're trying to do this from scratch. But the last thing is you don't have to do this from scratch um, because we know that a lot of people do absorption experiments and use you know, a handful of different um, apparatus to do so. We went ahead and wrote a program called raw to AIF, which um, can take a range of instrument files and convert it simply to the AIF. So it'll, it'll scrape all that data, all that metadata and all the adsorption information from the instrument specific file and report that in this universal way that you can share with anybody and they can open in their text editor or you, know, you can import it into things like PyGaps and reanalyze it using all the tools that are available there. And so I'll show you now um, how to uh, use 
um, raw to AIF, just as an example. I'm going to try to do this live, so let's hopefully it doesn't crash. So when you go to raw, so the website is raw to AIF.adsorptioninformationformat.com. You then just need to go and choose which type of file you want to uh, change. And so I came prepared. I have a range of micromeritics uh, uh, example data um, here to uh, convert. So I just click the file type that is associated with the micromeritics. I then just drag the micromeritics data over. Uh, and it failed. <laughs> Try again. And so if everything works well, you'll see an output of the adsorption isotherm. Um, you can see the adsorption branch. You can see the type of adsorptive it found and the name of the, adsorp uh, of the adsorbents um, and the temperature. And then you can download this file. Uh, sorry, don't know why that happened. You can then download this file, yeah, which it just downloaded here. And sorry. So it just downloaded here a sample a dot AIF, and you can open that in your text editor. And there you go. And then has all these lines. You can see we have an unknown operator. We have an adsorptive related to um, nitrogen N2. We have the temperature, we have a sample mass, and then you have the lines associated with the adsorption branch and the desorption branch. And the nice thing about the raw to AAF app is that you can also look at um, AAF um, files that are AAF as well. So. If you have, if someone sent you an AAF and you want to see what's in it quickly, you can just drag that across and you can see um, what kind of uh, adsorption isotherm is related to that. Um, and you can see, let's see if there's another one here. Yeah, it's another one. Just to show you that it works for all different types of adsorption isotherms. Anyway, back to my presentation. So you can find this on the website uh, shown here or using this QR code. Um, please note that this is a single uh, <laughs> program that works uh, on a droplet web app somewhere in the world. Um, so sometimes it, if it, there's too many users, it may be a little bit buggy, but um, as we can see there, it works you know, very well and is an easy way for us to update this. So, um, if you have any problems with certain files not converting, please contact me. We try to update this app and update our converters and passes um, as much as we can. So it works for all different types of files. Um, yeah. <clears throat> We've also been working on other implementations. So not just um, adsorption, uh, experimental adsorption isotherms. Um, there's also a bunch of uh, passes for Rasper. Um, simulation data as well as the YAF um, simulation data and it just shows you that you know um, you can see here a um, AAF associated with some um, RASPA simulations that I did recently for a collaborator and just is an easy way to include information about when the uh, simulation was conducted, uh, which exact code I used, um, which uh, force fields were used and it's just an easy way that we can share information about you know um, the experiment and share it with experimental co colleagues in a way that there is no um, guessing what um, units uh, pressure or um, adsorption amount is in. So I'd like to finish by just uh, encouraging you to join the um, development effort. Uh, the AF uh, development team is on GitHub and you know we, you can see the work we're doing on the different uh, adsorption file passes and um, you know, give us information or pull 
uh, suggest uh, updates to the dictionary and all those type of things. And so ultimately what I hope you can think about what you can do with AF is you can use this so you can share your data with the collaborators in a um, very clear and concise way. You can upload this information with your manuscript as just simply supporting information, or you can also just store it on your computer for later. So, you, you know, you don't, when you've re returned some data, there's no guessing about what that data contains. Um, so, in summary, um, the AF is a flexible data format for describing absorption experiments. I guess that's an important point that um, this star format is extreme, or star syntax, sorry, is extremely flexible. So, it can describe all different parts of your experiments. And um, especially, you know, if there's some parts of an experiment that's not uh, described by the dictionary, you can still use the, um, the star format to describe that. And, um, we will hopefully include more of the things in that dictionary as we go, but there may be some things that you want to include that, you know, no one else might want to, but you know, the, the format can do that. Um, remember that data names are defined, um, you know, using that data name, the data value uh, pair, um, and you can produce and use and uh, edit AAFs using your text editor or just use the raw to AAF web app or even your own code. Um, you can see how we did this with the Rust to AI uh, program, et cetera. So ultimately, I hope we have a brighter future for sharing adsorption data files. So um, everyone's speaking the same language uh, and there is no, uh, I guess, guessing when we're trying to recreate or reuse information that's out there in the literature. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge, uh, you know, the fantastic work that um, we'll be doing in this IU IUPAC project. Um, some really talented uh, colleagues are here that uh, have really spurred this um, format into life. Um, in particular, I want to thank uh, Dan Sedaris and uh, Paul Iacomi because um, without them and a little bit of help from Renko here, uh, there would be no adsorption format. So ultimately a bulk of the, the coding and um, behind the scenes work has been done by um, us four and uh, <laughs> it's uh, it's a lot of work for just four people so I really encourage you to join our github and join the development team to you know make uh, this format even better than it already is um, thank you all for your your time and um, your uh, your efforts and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have yeah thank you Jack for this uh, great presentation and uh, overview we have quite a number of questions, so um, we have also a few right. minutes time for questions. Um, one question came from two uh, uh, people joining, Andre Bezokov and also from uh, Abdulaj al -Hajj. My pronunciation is not very good, uh, apologies. It's about the equilibration criteria. This is something we have discussed also in the working group quite a number of times. So. Is it planned to also include equilibration criteria as metadata into the AIF format? Yes, so that is something that, um, you know, Micromeritics data ha has, or the Micromeritics um, files have information about when each adsorption point is taken. So that time information we can include as, um, or within the AIF, but I guess one of the things that um, we're trying to do right now is to describe as much information as possible, but not to put um, criteria or um, limits on what is accept uh, what is uh, too long or what is long enough in terms of equilibration time, and what is um, not long enough. So I guess we're not at the stage yet where we're, we uh, require certain criteria to include. Um, it's just as long as we just want to ensure that information about the pressure is um, included and if information about the pressure and amount absorbed is included, uh, then we can um, do that. So I guess, yes, we, we are thinking about that and that's something we want to implement um, in the near future. Um, but mm -hmm. I don't, I want to make sure that everyone knows that it's more just share your information and um, describe it as best you can. Um, and I guess the key yeah. thing is that the, I, yeah, sorry, go on. 
Yeah, I think it's an important point. I mean, uh, we also discussed it already in the working group and we should include basically the equilibration criteria that were applied for the measurements uh, in the future, either as a text line or, I mean, what you suggest is to do it for each point, basically, that would add a lot of data, but uh, that's maybe an, an open discussion. We have. To, I think it's a very important input. Yeah. Thank you for uh, yeah. for this input. Then there's another question from Josef Manning. Are you planning measures to promote engagement of experimental researchers with the ARF data format? To my understanding, the main driver for adoption of the CIF format uh, was publishers requiring those files during paper submission. So I think this is a quite political question, of course. Um, so, um, of course, we have started to contact also publishing uh, agents and, and publishers. Um, at this point, we don't want to make this obligatory uh, and to put too much pressure. But, of course, uh, in the end, we think this would be the ideal way if the journals would require and request the, um, um, the authors basically to submit their data as, as long as they are quite standardized data, basically, like uh, nitrogen adsorption isotherms and maybe also have pressure isotherms uh, in, in such a format. Yeah, I think this would be the Yeah, and, way. and I think I think in the future we, we will have to share information anyway. Um, so if we're going to have to share information about the adsorption experiment, are we going to do that by including, you know, your tabulated data in the manuscripts? Are you going to include it in the supporting information of the very long table or are you going to use the AAF because it's purpose built for this? So publishers at some point are going to, well, a, a lot of publishers are already pushing this idea of open data and will you know, ensure that you have to include it as um, tabulated information, the supporting information. But if it's easier to include the AAF, then people will use AIF. So that's one, I guess, avenue we're trying to explore or trying to um, yeah, use. Mm -hmm. We have a couple of more questions. Maybe uh, we can only have one short question and short answer. Um, there's one question mm -hmm. about isobars. Is it also pop possible to describe isobars using the AF format? Yes. Great. Yes. Thank you very much. <laughs> we haven't seen that... it yet, but yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Great. Okay. In the interest of time, we have. Uh, a q and a session later so maybe we can also transfer some of the questions to the discussion later i see already yeah. thank, you very much, thank you very much yeah thank you very much jack for this wonderful presentation and uh, we have already veronique van spreiberg and Luis van der Fuss as the next presenters and um, just give me a second let you let me make you the moderator uh, Sorry for this, just a second. Now you should be able to share your slides. Looks very good. Yeah. Can you see your slides? Hello, everyone. Yes, looks great. Okay. Um, yes. Sorry about this. There yes, you. okay. Uh, so thank you. Uh, good morning. So um, so this is a joint presentation of myself and also my colleague uh, Louis van der Fuss. So we will talk a little bit on this, um, some challenges in simulating accurate absorption properties and also, of course, also their data management. Huh? So uh, basically, uh, the examples that we will use are uh, taken, of course, of uh, some of the research that is performed here at the Center for Molecular Modeling in Ghent. Um, and we can see, of course, where uh, absorption is important, like, for example, here in this upper corner, uh, we are studying uh, the C2 and C3 uh, separation with the MOF membranes. Then here in this along the diagonal, uh, we see uh, covalent organic frameworks, which we can use to separate, for example, uh, flue gases uh, with carbon, carbon dioxide, nitrogen, uh, or also use costs for photocatalysis, where, for example, water also first has to absorb to this, the material. And uh, here, this is also um, part of a collaboration where we are looking at MOFs uh, to detect uh, volatile organic compounds. And as you can see, all of these, um, these problems are done in close collaboration with experimental uh, colleagues. Huh? So um, the question, of course, we can ask now ourselves is, why do we need uh, molecular simulations uh, for adsorption? 
there are various uh, ways, of course, to, to, to introduce adsorption properties into the computational uh, workflow, let's say. A first uh, possibility, what of course we have seen a lot also in the field, is where we do a screening of materials. So, uh, a typical example, we start from a big database of MOFs, like here, for example, the core MOF uh, database. We use a simple method like GCMC with generic force fields. We narrow down the number of materials and then ultimately we do a more, um, more detailed uh, simulations and we receive a limited number of materials which are important for the problem at hand. So this is high throughput screening. Uh, we can also look more in particular to some uh, particular uh, materials and so this is taken also from a recent paper that we did together with a group of Ivo van Kelekom in Leuven uh, where uh, they looked at uh, the formation of mixed matrix membranes and uh, there zeolite was used as a sodium-based uh, sodium zeolite uh, and uh, this uh, material was uh, very good um, for selective absorption of CO2 compared to methane. I also will discuss a little bit later on the further slides. And here you can already see some uh, isotherms uh, that we uh, calculated. So these are two examples on where to use uh, simulations. Now, what do we need to simulate absorption? Uh, so we need, uh, first of all, a methodology to sample uh, the potential energy surface and what we would mostly see into the field is that people would use uh, GCMC calculations, so ground canonical uh, Monte Carlo simulations, where of course we need a lot of energy evaluation, so it's rather um, computationally extensive depending on the method you use. What you would see less in the field nowadays is also the, the classical VFT and also we will talk a little bit uh, later in the presentation about that. Um, what we also need is a methodology to describe the potential energy surface and that's a figure that we now often use in uh, many of our presentations uh, and basically of course we would like to do quantum mechanics it's it's it's, it's the most accurate but uh, it's also computationally quite expensive and as we need a lot of energy evaluations uh, to simulate absorption isotherms uh, this is mostly not the uh, way that people use uh, uh, nowadays to calculate absorption properties or at least not isotherms so the, the method that most of the people use are classical force fields nowadays, uh, which uh, allows to do more energy evaluations in a computationally efficient way, but we lose quantum accuracy. And for that reason, we are also looking quite intensively at methods where we can uh, keep the quantum accuracy, uh, but do it also in a computationally um, uh, efficient way, and that is with machine learning potentials, where we basically derive um, numerical potential based on underlying quantum mechanical data. And so we will give examples of each of these, these methods in the presentation. Um, so uh, if we move on, so here is basically this, the example that we will discuss today. So the first example, and every, of course in every example we will try this, the importance of having good data and also trying to store them in a good way, so of the importance of the AF format, let's say. So basically the first example that I already slightly touched upon is the example of this, the uh, selective absorption in the sodium-based uh, zeolite system. So uh, what we can see here into this, this figure, these are experimental uh, isotherms, uh, single uh, this component isotherms that were taken in the group of Ivo van Kerekom, uh, where we already see that CO2 uh, this has stronger absorption into the framework compared to uh, methane and nitrogen. But uh, to have insight, it would also be interesting uh, to also have data on co-absorption and also have insight onto specific absorption sites. For that reason, what you will see here is uh, isotherms of co-absorption uh, of CO2 and methane. And also here we see some preferential absorption sites. So uh, what we also can learn uh, from the simulations is that, of course, CO2 uh, this absorbs much stronger uh, than the other molecules on this disc cation, uh, which is of course an important driver already why CO2 is um, selectively absorbed. But interestingly here also when we look at the co-absorption isotherms, so when you have the diamond uh, this um, 
profile, let's say. These are single component isotherms. We can see here the red one and also here the blue one for CO2. And this is for this methane. So we can see in any time that the CO2 is preferred compared to methane. But if we do co-absorption, we see that the selectivity or the, the, uh, the for, for the CO2 compared to the methane is drastically improved. So here you can see that the, this one of methane goes uh, drastically down uh, when we have the co-absorption. This has to do with two things, with the preferential absorption size, but also with uh, diffusive properties of methane uh, through this eight-membered ring. So basically here you can see what extra insight we can learn from this, these uh, simulations. Now one can question now, uh, why is an an, a standardized uh, format, data format important? So why can this help us? Uh, in the first instance, of course, to easily uh, transfer data between your collaborators. For example, here between experimental groups and between theoreticians, that's one thing. But second, of course, also for the rest of the world, because if we publish a, a paper, then we can also submit the data in a uniform uh, this, uh, format, and also other people can work on the data without having troubles of knowing what exactly, exactly the data were. So, and here we fully respect, of course, these uh, fair principles. So that's the first uh, uh, example on how IEF is important, both for experimentalists and for uh, theoreticians. All right, so um, welcome everyone also from my side. So for the second uh, the topic of today, uh, we're gonna have a look at a critical assessment of what people are usually doing nowadays when simulating absorption, so the current state of the art. And we're going to, um, for that, we are going to investigate or look a little bit closer on one of the applications that Fiorico already mentioned, which is these um, um, using MOF, MOFs as membranes for uh, an efficient, an energy efficient separation of uh, different kinds of olefins and paraffins. For example, here we would have uh, the separation of ethane from ethene, for example, using a ZIF8 uh, based membrane. Now, um, we mentioned the current state of the art. This current state of the art is basically um, using GCMC calculations with, in combination with classical force field. As was mentioned before, uh, the reason why is mainly because uh, we need a lot of energy uh, evaluations to do GCMC and therefore classical force fields are usually the way to go to keep it computationally feasible. Now the question is of course how accurate are these? Specifically if we want to do a, uh, a large throughput screening study. Um, and therefore we're going to uh, look at a case study, uh, namely uh, adsorption of ethane in ZIF8. And we're going to have a look at the adsorption isotherm as generated by GCMC using various force The IF format, uh, as was mentioned before already, it's, uh, we really need this in order to, uh, to compare um, uh, adsorption isotherms, not only between force field and, and, or between simulation and, and experiment, but also uh, between different simulations. Uh, and in a second step, we could also wonder, but this has already been touched upon in the previous uh, presentations, um, that it would be very interesting, of course, to be able to store multiple isotherms in a single file. We have seen already, you could do, basically, it is, of course, possible. We have seen the example of adsorption and desorption branches. Well, basically, you could also include different adsorption isotherms of different um, um, force fields, for example, but which are, for the rest, the same in all the experimental and all the simulation setup, just the force field that changes. Um, we could also wonder if it would not be um, interesting, and this is an open question, uh, open for discussion, if it would be interesting to include the RE coefficient directly. It has also already been touched upon previously, um, because this RE coefficient, if you would need to extract it from the adsorption as a term uh, a posteriori, you need a fitting, and that fitting, as has been uh, uh, perfectly showcased by, uh, by Stefan, that's not always very accurate. Okay, so uh, let's proceed to the third uh, item on the list. So here um, I'm going to explain how we can use also machine learning potentials to uh, derive uh, isotherms with initial accuracy. So these are brand new results. Um, so basically the idea here is, so if we have here a plot of accuracy versus required computational resources, uh, we can say, okay, uh, this is the desired accuracy, and then we can also have a line from this is what we have computationally, or computational uh, uh, resources, let's say. Uh, what we now most of the time do is GCMC calculations with classical force field, all the uh, except for the important sampling, of course, but most of the examples uh, do this. this. Uh, on the accuracy scale, this is not good. Uh, on the other hand, as we already heard in the, the previous uh, few slides, uh, we would like to do GCMC with DFT, if it's computationally not feasible. So basically, a new direction is indeed to use the machine learning potentials in combination with the Grand Canonical Monte Carlo 
uh, procedure, and for that uh, we can use this indeed this new uh, avenue, let's say, uh, where we uh, derive machine learning potentials. So let's explain a little bit more what uh, is going on here. So uh, we are going to use GCMC, but and we are also in this corner of the potential energy surface. Results with the machine learning potential, I would say brand new results. Now the question is, uh, how is AIF also important for these type of uh, problems? So um, we also have seen that heats of absorption have been um, shown here in the previous slides. And so the question is, can we extract heats of absorption from plotted isotherms? So uh, this is from another work. So this is uh, taken from this uh, famous article in Science on the water absorption in the MOF uh, uh, 303 uh, systems. Uh, so here we see uh, water absorption at various temperatures. And uh, suppose now that you want to uh, extract the uh, heats of absorption from these isotherms. Yeah, the original authors, of course, uh, they had the raw data and said so they could do this by using this uh, clausius clapeyron equation. And so this is the data that they also published in their this paper on the heats of absorption in terms of the, the water uptake, let's say. So if we, for example, as the readers of the paper, we also want to work with this data, what can we do? Ah, we can try to overlay uh, these uh, these uh, isotherms uh, manually, of course, it's not very accurately. And then we can use some uh, data points uh, in, in terms of some loadings and some temperatures. And then we can also try to also uh, estimate the heats of absorption. One can see, this is the curve that we receive by doing this procedure. One can see, of course, that we introduce a lot of errors. Eh? And so this is not the way to go to just overlay isotherms that are uh, published. So it would be great in the future if people indeed would uh, submit their isotherms eh, uh, in this uh, machine readable format, basically, like the EIF. Uh, another point that might be interesting also for the AIF, and it's also open for discussion, is that it might be interesting to also include in the IF format loading dependent uh, heats of absorption it would also be interesting, I think, for the future. Okay, so now let's quickly go to the last example, uh, which is um, um, a try an extension of the methodology that we've seen so far, but that really in trying to push its limits. Because this was the, 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 the study that we have, or the cases that we have studied already, was the single cases, for example, and their GCM CMLP would be a really good standard of, of going forward. But the question is, what about if you look at absorption of vinyl, or even ternary, or even, even higher order mixtures, um, and that in combination with high throughput screening? Because in a high throughput screening, typically the available resources per system decrease, and so it might very well be, or it will be, the fact that GCM CMLP will be too expensive. And therefore, we're going to have a look at CDFT. And at first instance, we're going to look at CDFT as an alternative for GCMC when combining with force fields. Um, so basically, as a short um, um, uh, introduction, what CDFT basically is, as I mentioned before, it's an alternative to GCMC. And instead of um, um, explicitly modeling where the, uh, for example, absorbents are located inside your framework, you're going to model the grand potential, so the thermodynamic potential in the ground chemical ensemble, as a functional of the density. And this mathematical model, it contains two ingredients, the excess fun uh, function free energy and the adsorption potential. But if you have that, you can minimize this grand potential to get the equilibrium density profile. So the density of num number of molecules as a fun at, at each, each position inside the framework as a function of thermodynamic conditions. And of course, you can, you can integrate that to get the adsorption isotherm. You can also extract the adsorption energy and so on. But as mentioned, you need two inputs, the two inputs, the adsorption potential and the excess free energy. Now, the adsorption potential, that's rather straightforward to extract from the force field, but the excess free energy is a lot more difficult because it's a free energy, not a potential energy, but a free energy. So there's a thermodynamic or a, an ensemble averaging in between, which means that it's much more difficult to extract it from force fields. And if you would do it uh, for uh, methane in MO5, it's relatively easy. But then it's still uh, straightforward because it's a, a some simple molecule. For example, here, this is the experimental curve. Um, and if you have a look at uh, CDFT with increasingly more complex functionals, you really converge towards the true result. But if you have a look at um, more, slightly more complex molecules, such as carbon dioxide, um, it becomes a lot more complex. Uh, you see a lot more spread over it, and there's not really a clear convergence trend, which means that there's still work to be done here. And at the end of the day, this is very much work in progress. We would be interested in also, or we are going to have a look at using machine learning to not only fix the problem of, of, of extracting functional uh, 
from the force field the data, but actually just getting rid of the force field uh, entirely, and also using uh, uh, or using machine learning and machine learning potentials to get CBFD up, up initio or uh, MLP level of accuracy. And with that, only very briefly, and then I will stop very briefly um, um, for the what does AI for the CBFD mean? Well, basically. Uh, Everything has already been said, so really, of course, you might need some additional fields and labels right, in order to define what you mean here, but this is all technical stuff, not really that important. You already mentioned how to store additional profiles. Uh, heat of absorption was mentioned by Jolik earlier, but also the grand potential in CDFT might be very interesting. And also the problem or the, the issue of, of how to store multi-component absorption isotopes has already been touched before, so I can, I can skip that. And, and with that, I would like to um, end our presentation. Um, like of course to thank all the uh, the persons PhD students that have been involved in doing this work and our collaborators at the KU Leuven, uh, at the UB, and also the Ghent, and of course our uh, our main audiences. Um, and with that, I would like to end our presentation and thank you very much for uh, listening. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Louis, and also uh, Veronique for this great overview and uh, important insights into the simulation. There are a number of questions. Maybe I start with one question from myself. I mean, um, regarding the, the whole group of theoretical uh, groups working on the simulation of adsorption isotherms, uh, what would be your recommendation how to um, yeah, export the data and how to deposit the data at the moment? Or maybe you can also give some insights which programs you are currently using, maybe to convert some of your data into AIF files already, or maybe also into other formats and how to deposit them. Yeah, sure. Um, well, um, as we have done for all the examples that you have seen here, we have, well, the people that are listed here have actually have also generated these AI formats uh, using um, mainly, it was uh, the two programs that also are mentioned by, uh, by Jack Evans, so uh, Raspa and Yoff. Um, and for both, there was a script that is already available on the GitHub that's which, which, which basically does the trick. It's, it only required a little bit of like tweaking uh, because one of, for example, one uh, slight issue that we encountered is um, how um, the, the, the data structure that, you, uh, sorry, the directory structure that you use, but that's a very personal uh, choice, of course. If you do simulations, GCMC calculations, a lot, a lot of people just do a single pressure in each directory differently, and then you have to collect all this data in order to generate a single IEF file. But that's just technical, and from a very slight adjust, adjustment to the script that we're given, it is possible. So the main thing here is, I think, technically, it's very easy. The only thing that we need to think about is how are we going to um, um, maintain, or how are we going to suggest everything, what's, what's going to be the standards in, in how we uh, collect all this data, and are we going to provide possible alternatives, or are we allowed to to uh, to give the user a choice on where to extract its its simulation from? Um, that's a little bit the the the, the 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 issue that remains, I think. Um, how to define where to collect the information from? But once you know where to collect it from, it's very easy to do so. That's where that were the, the the so that was basically the the experience that I have um, or that our researchers basically have, have have shown us. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, partly. I mean, of course, yes. Uh, I think it's, it shows that there's also uh, this is still in the process. I think a, a question also comes from Michael, uh, Miguel Jorge. Uh, Jorge um, um, should we have an analogous to the AIF for simulated isotherms? It is very common to find simulated data that is not reproducible due to the lack of technical information. I think this question also summarizes a little bit the discussion. And I think, do you want to comment on it? Uh, I, you showed already some uh, aspects in your presentation, but. Yeah, 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 sure. I think um, this is um, um, a lot of aspects when you look at GC, we were discussing a little bit earlier about, about um, um, I think it was about how to uh, get, reach equilibrium in experimental uh, setup, but this is also an issue in, in the simulate, simulations. Um, we have mentioned the fact that when you do uh, simulations, you need a lot of uh, samples, and this samples, how long you sample, that is basically uh, an input parameter that the user has to define, and it's very much, it has a high impact, or it can have a high impact on your results. So reporting on that in the IEF format is, I think, really necessary if you want to achieve the truly fair data uh, principles. Um, but that's basically, um, um, again, it's, that's very easy to achieve. You just need 
we just need to, as a as basically as a community, come together and define where we're going to put this information in which of these um, uh, dotted labels that were um, dotted names that were mentioned by by Jack Evans. Where were we going to put this? But I fully agree they should be in there, and there are other things maybe as well that might be uh, important, such as in GCM, we have a lot of other settings that might be tuned, uh, which could have an impact. And specifically, to go to multi-component GCM, it's even more uh, crucial. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you very much. Um, I think in the interest of time, then we should continue to the next presentation. Thank you very much for this great overview. And then we okay, come thank to, uh, thank you. And then we come to Dan Siderius from NIST. I will make you the moderator. Dan, you should be able to share your slides. All right. And, uh, All right. Is my is my first slide available now? Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. Okay, perfect, perfect. All right. So um, in this segment, but it's empty <clears throat> at the moment, but it's, it's empty. How about are we changing slides? Uh, let's try this. Let's try this again. Hmm. Yeah, now we say uh, data foibles. Perfect. Okay. Okay. Yes. Good. Now, now it's available. Okay. Um, as as part of the segment, uh, I thought it would be kind of interesting to talk about how AIF provides some opportunities for correcting issues that I've identified in literature data while collecting absorption isotherms for the NIST isotherm database. Uh, this is based heavily on experience uh, that myself and also the students that have worked for me over the last 10 years have encountered while finding isotherms in papers. And so each time we look at an example here, I'd like to tie it back to a solution that AIF provides to some of the problems that we've observed. And so what I want to do is present a few problematic isotherms and then ask the audience to uh, to submit some questions or, or use the question tab to submit some ideas on what they think the problem is with this isotherm. Um, and uh, Stefan, if, if you could uh, relay those questions forward to me, uh, that would be very helpful. Um, and then after maybe a minute or two of providing the, the, the audience an opportunity to provide some uh, feedback, then we'll go through what I think the problem is with an isotherm. Um, and, so Dan, should the I isotherm. Make an organizer maybe or? Um, you, you can moderate the questions. Um, okay, I, I will moderate. Okay, good. Okay, thank you. Um, the isotherms that I'm going to show today are inspired by real liter isotherms published in literature articles uh, that were examined by NIST scientific, scientific staff. Um, I have modified some of these isotherms both to anonymize the data and also to highlight particular issues in the data presentation. So this is not directly out of papers. It's been changed a little bit by me to make it a little, a, a little clearer. So the first example that I want to uh, show up as an isotherm here as, as a set of three uh, isotherms, two of hydrogen and one of nitrogen. The nitrogen isotherm is listed at 77 Kelvin, and the hydrogen isotherms are listed at 77 and 87 Kelvin. And uh, I'd like to now give the audience a moment to submit some, to, to examine this isotherm, and then using the question tab, uh, provide some feedback on what they think may be a problem with this isotherm, or any of the isotherms shown here purposely being a little bit vague to make everyone think. So David was first, he says the hydrogen critical temperature is about 30 Kelvin, so it cannot be on relative pressure axis. Um, okay, so maybe we could take two more uh, submitted. Not the same. Variation in temperature causes these bulges. Loading axis not high enough. H2 is supercritical at 77 Kelvin. Okay, I think we've had enough feedback so far. Um, is it's already it's already addressed the main issue that I want to point out in this isotherm. And so, I, and I, I will I'll add one thing. Some of the the noise in the data here is the result of digitization. Um, this was just difficulty in in attaining the points out of the isotherms in, in the paper. Uh, but the main issue for this isotherm is that the isotherm is given as plotted versus relative pressure. And it was correctly pointed out in the very first in the very first comment that the critical temperature of hydrogen is 
according to the NIST chemistry webbook, is 33 Kelvin. Um, and so both of the hydrogen isotherms here are at supercritical conditions, but have been plotted versus P over P0. Um, when I have encountered these isotherms, uh, I, I do not ask my students that work for me to contact the authors to find out what was intended. Um, I think it is a personal responsibility to contact authors and ask what do they mean by this isotherm. And almost universally, when I encounter isotherms like this in papers, what an author actually meant was that the pressure scale was in atmospheres. Even so, the P0 value that was used for all of the isotherms in this case was actually one atmosphere. Um, even though in normal usage, using P sub zero typically implies that it's a saturation pressure. And so this plot is misleading, but at the same time, I've now discovered over the course of 10 years that this is a common convention. I still think it's incorrect, but it's a very common convention done in presenting literature, in the presenting literature isotherms. Um, and so the way that we can solve this with AIF is that we can remove the ambiguity. The, the plot is stating P over P zero, but what it's really meaning is that P, P zero is one atmosphere. Whereas if, using AIF, we can eliminate this ambiguity by directly stating this in the digital data. And this is, can be done with two different, uh, with, via two different uh, solutions within the AIF format. Uh, one of the ways is that we can, excuse me, let me put my laser pointer on here. One of the options is to use the adsorb P0 key in the loop structure that Jack described, and then always provide the saturation pressure in situ in the isotherm itself. The other solution or option is to uh, is to put the saturation pressure as one of the, the data fields in the metadata header of the AIF isotherm. And so then uh, the, the reason that there are these two options is that if you're recording the saturation pressure uh, in real time with your isotherm, then that might be fluctuating a little bit based on, on the atmospheric conditions uh, of your lab. Uh, so if it's changing, it's better to have this inside of the loop structure. However, if you're assuming that it's a constant, then you can state this pressure in your metadata header uh, in the file directly. All right, so let's move on to another example. I have another set of isotherms uh, shown here, um, two carbon dioxide isotherms and two nitrogen isotherms. Um, and now I'd like to give it to, to the audience for a moment to see if they have some feedback on what could be problematic in this set of isotherms. And Stefan, if if, uh, if some answers come in, feel free to start to repeating them. Yes, I'm waiting for the answers, so. Okay. Ah, one says P0 again, then carbon dioxide temperature are mislabeled. Um, Something with the temperature must be wrong. More CO2 is absorbed at high temperature. Absorption should decrease with T. Should the CO2, so, oh, CO2 seems mislabeled. 273 Kelvin isotherm should be higher than 298 Kelvin. Kinetic problems with CO2. Same as before, nitrogen is supercritical. Also unlikely to achieve P over P0 of one for CO2 measurement. Temperature is wrong. Ohan Talu. Carbon dioxide, higher capacity, higher temperature. Do, do you want more answers, Dan? That, that's that's plenty. That's plenty here. Um, and the the audience has zeroed in on many many issues with this isotherm. And this and this is actually taken from a real literature graphic from a paper. Um, first of all, it is absolutely correct that there is a problem with the temperatures for the CO2 isotherms in this case. Uh, the 273 isotherm should indeed be higher than the 298 Kelvin isotherm. And so clearly. There was a problem in the labeling uh, of the data. And this is a, a, a common problem that cannot be identified quickly by novices. And so the students that I have that work to digitize data for the NIST isotherm database uh, receive a crash course in adsorption science. I typically teach them enough information to read isotherms in about three to four days. Uh, and But at the same time, they're not going to be able to pick up on this subtlety in the data, recognizing that, that the 273 and 298 isotherms were actually swapped in this case. Um, secondarily, though, as been pointed out, there's a similar issue with the pressure scale here because it's plotted versus P over P0, but both of the nitrogen isotherms are at temperatures far above the critical temperature of nitrogen. So then the, 
when you see this set of isotherms, it actually raises a whole slew of problems. Is that what exactly is the pressure scale in this case? Are the, because the CO2 isotherms are below the critical temperature of CO2, and so they could be plotted versus the saturation pressure, but were they? Um, if you look up the actual saturation pressures and then do some conversions, assuming, say, that the nitrogen isotherm is actually at one atmosphere, then you get this very bizarre uh, setup for the isotherm here, where after converting to over to bars, then we see that there's a long extension of both CO2 isotherms, and, and I, here I have not corrected the temperatures yet, uh, because the students do have enough training to be able to convert from relative pressure to um, absolute pressure by looking up the saturation pressure just in, say, the NIST chemistry web book or in using a, a, a some some correlation function. But at the same time, they would not have corrected the isotherm uh, for uh, for the for the uh, for the for the temperature issue. Um, and so when we started looking at this set of isotherms, we realized that there was still a problem with this data set, and we contacted the authors to find out what, what, the, what, what the plot actually meant. And it turned out this plot was done exactly the same way as the previous plot with hydrogen, where their pressure scale was actually one atmosphere across the board. Uh, and so then I'm, here I had not actually labeled the temperatures correctly, excuse me. Uh, but in this case, uh, all of the isotherms were plotted, should have been on a pressure scale of zero to one when atmospheres and shown uniformly like this. Um, I would argue that uh, AIF is a perfect solution for avoiding this type of issue because all of the units and all of the temperatures can be stated in the metadata and then we're not relying on uh, graphical interpretation of the isotherms for actually understanding what the data means physically. Um, and also it should eliminate issues with the temperature labeling uh, that, that could be made by the authors uh, in, in the paper and may not be caught in review. Lastly, and I think I would also argue, and this is perhaps more, uh, this is a more arguable point, is that the, the use of reduced pressure units um, can be misleading or problematic when you're comparing different temperatures. Um, if you're comparing, say, an, an argon isotherm at 87 Kelvin to a nitrogen isotherm at 77 Kelvin, that can be very useful, and it has a very, and it has a very particular meaning uh, within like the characterization of absorbent materials. But Comparing, say, a nitrogen 77 Kelvin isotherm to a CO2 isotherm at, at some other temperature that's maybe perhaps more process relevant may not be meaningful uh, for a figure. Um, the last example is not necessarily an example so much as an anecdote. Um, when uh, I was working on a project a few years ago, uh, with Corey Simon from uh, Oregon State University, where we were interested in building a machine learning model to predict the the Henry coefficients of a very of 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 different adsorption systems. Where so say we built a matrix where we have for for a particular temperature we have materials on one axis and uh, adsorbates on on the other axis. Uh, using information from a database like the NIST isotherm database, we tried to predict the missing Henry constants in that grid. So we use the NIST isotherm database to build to, to build up the grid and then fill in the gaps or fill in the data sets and cells that we could fill in and then use a machine learning algorithm to fill in the rest. Um, to do that, we had to data mine the NIST isotherm database and attempt to extract Henry constants out of the isotherm data. This proved to be very difficult uh, simply because Getting accurate Henry constants requires good low pressure data. And this was pointed out by Jack in his original, in his original uh, um, presentation this morning, where if, if the isotherm is not given in a way that highlights the, the low pressure region, then we cannot digitize this data accurately. Um, so it's much, much better to get this data from some, say, a data table. And so for the two isotherms that I've shown here, uh, you can see that one isotherm, you can pretty much pick out the, the low pressure region uh, simply because it's, it, it's, it's, it's a fairly low slope. But the second isotherm in orange, we have a compression of data points in the very low pressure region, and it's very difficult to extract these data points uh, accurately. And so if we were to take this data and then digitize it in the way that Jack described, and then attempt to extract Henry constant, it'd be very, very difficult. So first, I took the blue isotherm and I I, I took the data that I created, I redigitized it, and then using a very, very crude, just 
take the loading divided by a pressure and extrapolate out to pressure equals zero, I can get a decent es estimate of the Henry constant from this isotherm. It turns out that in this case, the Henry constant was exactly five. I created this data digitally myself. Uh, so extrapolating, I would have gotten very, very close to the true Henry constant. The orange isotherm, on the other hand, when I digitize this data, I actually ended up with pressures that were negative, which is non-physical, non of course. Um, and then when we started attempting to extrapolate the ratio of the loading to the pressure down to pressure equals zero, I never found a good asymptote or a good ex extrapolate that I could that I could identify in this case. And so using this type of data to try to estimate a Henry constant is basically a, a fool's errand. And AIF, on the other hand, would do this very, would provide this data very nicely for us. Um, and this was mentioned in the previous presentation as well, that once we have the tabular data, then we can actually do these types of data manipulations and, and modify the data in a way that allows us to estimate other thermophysical properties and then build the machine learning models or the, the AI models that, uh, that would be useful for other applications. Um, and so that's the end of this segment. Um, I know I'm a little bit ahead of schedule, uh, but I'd be happy to take some questions if anyone is interested um, or to reflect on some of the experiences we've had over the years of, of collecting isotherm data and putting it into the NIST isotherm database. I'm gonna talk about more of this toward the end, uh, but I'm happy to take any, any comments from, from the audience, right? Or questions from the audience uh, at, at this time. Yeah, thank you, Dan, for this great, very instructive quiz and uh, the great examples. Are there any questions in the chat at the moment? I don't see any, but maybe there are coming there is one coming thank you for the af presentation i wonder if there is an effort for already published data in this to extract these data in a standardized aif format okay so in my in my section at the at the end of the at the end of the the the, the workshop i will actually demonstrate how to convert isotherms that are in the nist database to aif uh, we haven't spent the time to have a direct like a click like one button transfer over to aif yet uh, simply because the data standard is still evolving. Uh, but I will show how to use existing tools to convert to AIF even today. It can be done within a Python notebook in about five lines of code. It's very easy. Mm -hmm. Then there is another question from Miguel. Uh, is there a way to report mistakes in the NIST database? They are rare, but we've spotted a few. Uh, th th the best way to contact me is just to contact me about that. Uh, there is actually a feedback tool within ICDB, and I, and I actually want to say that's very kind to say that there aren't very many or there are only a few because there's actually quite a few. <laughs> I find more and more every time we, 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 we go through the database. Um, to help un people understand this isotherm database a little bit better is that we have students that collect the isotherm data and then it's audited by me. Uh, but there's, it's impossible for me to audit all of the data. Um, and so there are, there are s sets of data that slip through that have problems, and we try to identify those and correct them as we encounter those sets of data. I think that's also an advantage of the AIF file because then the author it's himself is, uh, or herself is responsible basically for the data quality. Yes. And um, it's basically a sort of delocalized uh, sort of information without the management requirement, um, similar to the internet, the web, and so on. There's another question. Um, can I ask how the current NIST database is collected? But I think you answered this already, right? I'd like to discuss that in my in my section at the end. Okay, very good. Okay, good. Then I don't see more questions at the moment. So we have now basically the chance also to have a more extended discussion of the presentations that we saw before we come to the um, to the application. So maybe I can ask all the speakers uh, basically to come to the to the board so with, that we have more like a plenary discussion. Um, that would be great. So yeah, please, if everybody could turn on his or her microphone, um, then this would be good. I can also promote people from the um, participant list to the speaker panel if someone is interested. I saw Miguel, for example. Miguel, would you be interested to join us? Uh, let me see if I find him. I can ask Miguel also. Yeah, 
he can join us and all the other participants uh, Timo is Timo also there yeah I'm here so ah okay great has Timo yeah Miguel good to see you uh, thank you for con contributing so what's your experience with the uh, data management uh, yeah I mean I think um, you know, we've been starting to use the NIST uh, database more and more to harvest experimental data. Um, and I think, you, you know, like, like I said in my comment, there, there, there are a few, a few problems, a few issues that we spot from time to time. But uh, it's, it's, uh, I just want to start by saying it's, it's an extremely valuable resource. Uh, and, you know, it, it, it takes an inordinate amount of work to put this together. So, so, so I just like, like to thank, thank Dan and, and his team for putting this together. And the, the, the absorption information file, I think, is, is, is the next logical step. I, I think it's really important. Um, one thing I would say that would be really valuable for, for I mean, for, for our group as modelers is, um, you know, and perhaps Ver Veronique will share the same, the same thoughts, is to link data, different types of data. So, for example, uh, there was even a recent paper from Baron Smith's group where, where they type, tried to use, I think, machine learning or something to map adsorption isotherms to SIF files from the crystal, crystallographic database. So because sometimes um, you, you, you pick up an isotherm and it's not entirely clear which sample that was, me was measured on, right? And, and I, I think sometimes we ended up having to follow kind of, kind of a reference trail, you know, to go to an earlier uh, paper from the same group or from a different group where they actually had the characterization data. Uh, you know, in particular, linking the isotherm data, absorption data to material characterization uh, nitrogen at 77 kelvin uh, xrd tga whatever else right so everything that's been done to characterize a sample then that being coupled linked to the absorption data would be extremely valuable mm -hmm. yeah i think that's important input yeah uh can i may i provide a little bit of a, a addition to that so, and this builds actually on some things that uh, that Veronique and, and Louis discussed as well, is that the AIF, I think that we could eventually start connecting it to these other resources. Uh, and I think that what perhaps Jack uh, Hideki and I need to work on is how to have a specifier in the file to point to say that this isotherm is connected to characterization data present in another resource or perhaps to a simulation input file, since we're kind of centering on a lot of us using RASPA or other open source um, simulation codes, let's link directly to an input file that could, in a sense, then re re be rerun by someone else. Um, I don't think that we should, as, as, a, as a group developing AIF, attempt to build a metadata block that can describe the entire simulation. That's a very difficult question by itself, and I think that that is not within the scope of AIF itself. Um, but if we can link to a RASPA file, or my group develops the feast code, we have our input files available as well. Um, then, then the, the data, say, if it's a simulated isotherm in an AIF file, then can be linked directly back to the input file that was used in the simulation, um, or perhaps it's to a pore size distribution uh, that's been available uh, available elsewhere. Um, I think that would be a very good idea in the in the future. Mm -hmm. So I also can ask. Uh, on this? Yes, if I may comment yep. on this, are we online? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. yes. Okay. So uh, the only thing that we uh, need to do is to think a little. Yeah. Um, yeah, because even now, when uh, when uh, data are published, also for isotherms, also from computational side, not all people uh, report all details that the data are absolutely reproducible, and that is of course a, a problem in the general term in the computational field. But uh, okay, as for absorption isotherms, it's also the case. So uh, we really have to think to do that in a structured way that we that all the data are reproducible, and how to do that eh? because. That's not so clear at the moment, so we really should have a protocol to do that. Eh? Uh, and I think that would be one of the tasks also to think long when we think further with the EIF format eh, on how to structure that. Yeah, I think uh, because it's not fully clear at the moment, uh, it's certainly clear what the intention is, but the implementation 
is something that we need to think about is in my opinion yeah, yeah. I mean, connecting data from my point of view in Germany, there's also, of course, the big initiative towards the electronic lab books. And uh, I think for this, it would be very helpful also to have standardized uh, data in, in different formats, basically, to connect the different experimental data directly in the lab book. And then, of course, the question is, which of these data do you make accessible, open accessible, and which ones you only keep for your uh, own records but I think in this context also there's uh, the opportunity given to connect certain experimental procedures um, of course this is also an ongoing discussion in the chemical community that many of the chemical processes are not well uh, defined and reproducible reproducibility of chemical synthesis also very much suffers from a lack of uh, a very well defined language and um, of course there's also there are initiatives also uh, introducing a computer language to program computers uh, to make uh, materials and to make compounds and uh, i think that is maybe also an aspect that will be become more important in the future but of course we cannot solve all questions at the same time and and therefore important part is to to start somewhere yeah. I have a question here also from Merdat Asghari, um, which is on the quality uh, check, basically. And he's asking, are we planning something like a SIF check? So an AIF check, basically, to check the self-consistency. Consistency. Uh, Paul, do you want to comment on this? or? Yeah, I really think that's a that's a that's a good idea. I think um, that might be something that is uh, that is planned further down the line. Essentially, just a, a quick uh, check whether, yeah, some things are realistic uh, or not. But it it also depends on how far we want to to take it. Whether we actually want to check for whether temperature is consistent uh, or pressure is consistent within the adsorbate. Um, uh, the adsorbate uh, saturated pressure range. But yes, this is a very good idea. Very good. Okay, great. There's also Theodore Stereotis. Theodore, do we want to come to the audience, to the speaker's board and comment a little bit or... Otherwise, I don't see further questions at the moment here. Ah, okay, there's one more question. Um, what is the bare amount of information to define AIF format by Hilal Dagla? So I think this is the question. What is the minimum amount of information to define the AIF format? As we understand this right, Hilal? Oh, maybe this question is difficult to understand. Then from Theodore Stereotis, one question concerning high pressure adsorption data, I guess excess quantities uh, should be reported, right? In such a case, data cannot be used, for instance, for isosteric enthalpies. Is there a strategy on this excess absolute issue? I think that's probably something Darren will comment on in this presentation. Darren, do we want to comment on this now? Or? I was planning to uh, cover the excess to absolute um, question in my talk, but as I, if I understand Theodore's question correctly, it relates to the um, including isosteric enthalpy or heat calculations actually in the AIF. Um, that if the excess is used, then um, if, if the data is presented as excess, then that's not um, um, not valid for the isosteric enthalpy calculations. Um, I suppose so far um, the isosteric enthalpy information hasn't been included in the AIF, um, so I suppose that's still an open question. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we keep this as an input. Very good. May I also comment on, on, on that, uh, Stefan? Sure, yeah. So there is also, that's also, it reminds me of uh, also a remark that one of our uh, PhD students mentioned uh, when he did uh, RASPA calculations to extract uh, the uh, adsorption uptake. 
if you want to also, um, there's, an, there's a thing there that it also can compute exact amounts or absolute amounts, but the way how it computes it, this might be tricky. And there might be, it's very, uh, it's very important that people are aware of how they compute it. And if you then uh, share this data, it's also important that it's been done in the same way for everyone. So this is a very important mark also for uh, simulation. So and I see a lot of people nodding, so I'm, it's not, <laughs> I did not make this up. <laughs> yeah, if I could just comment something I didn't include in my presentation, which I'll give later, is that at, at the moment, it's good that you can define excess or absolute as a quantity, but there's no way of describing experimentally how you've gone from excess to absolute. So I believe it's the same the same issue in reverse for simulations, where you, you're essentially calculating your total number of molecules in your simulation box, um, which might be analogous to absolute, and you need to convert back to excess for comparison to experiment. So yeah, it's the reverse case with experiment. Um, so you people could output um, absolute with high pressure data, um, and there's no way of knowing currently how that calculation was made. Um, let me just add on to that is that while we've been developing the technical specifications for AIF, we have built in features that allow the composer of the AIF to, to state explicitly what the isotherm is in terms of its type, whether it is an excess isotherm, absolute, and we've included the possibility of a net isotherm as well. Um, and then there's additionally an option to include both or multiple types of isotherm data in the loop structure of the AIF file. So you can have both absolute and excess listed directly together. Um, and so then I, I, I think I would like to echo what Darren and, and Louis has said is that either converting from excess to absolute or from absolute to excess, depending on whether you're coming from a simulation or an, or an experimental point of view, does depend on an algorithm. Um, and so that should be described somewhere how you've done that conversion. But at least the AAF has the option of including the results of that computation directly. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think that's also one of the advantages of the AAF format that um, it's a free text format basically where additional explanations can be added. And if there are, I mean, sometimes that's also the problem that different communities have different definitions for these terms, like we discussed earlier, then it can be specified in the in the AIF file. Yeah. Uh, we have a number of more questions. One is on the uncertainty. So um, given the challenges highlighted earlier about uh, considering error during measurements, uh, is there the capacity for AIF files to include uncertainty information? Yes. So what we have we have added to the to the data specification for AIF is that if you take any of the data fields and then append underscore uncertainty, then that is the the way of of including uncertainty in the output file. Uh, now. There is a question of what one means by uncertainty, and I would hope that the literature document that, that accompanies the isotherm would describe the, 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 the algorithmic process of estimating that uncertainty and stating what it actually means. Um, again, it's out of, outside of the scope of AIF to dictate a particular method. Um, it's up to the user to, to describe that in their, in their, in their disclosures. Mm -hmm. Very good. I'd also Paul. like to point out that the, the format itself is ex extremely versatile. So different types of columns, different types of uh, uh, new keys can be can be defined. While there might not be in the official specification yet, um, I've long for long uh, used, for example, some of the columns to assign uh, enthalpies of absorption to each to each point. So any kind of extension is possible as long as it is clarified in the format. Yeah, mm -hmm. Paul makes a very good point there in that this is very extensible. Um, and so when we eventually have like a check AIF function available online that will examine for file integrity, it's the same way that check sift looks for file integrity. Um, we, we will have a flow chart that our, our checker function follows that makes sure that the file is, follow, is, is following the correct rules. But if, if a user adds new fields, that do not break any of the functionality of, of AIF, they're perfectly acceptable. And there's a question from Kian Karimi. How mature is the AIF metadata now? Are they now in development phase or the AIF metadata is ready to be used 
for all the existing adsorbents in the in the literature. So my quick answer would be, I would say both. It's both in development and it's ready to use. So only when we use it, we will also <laughs> further develop it. So, um, but uh, it's ready to use for simple systems. For You can use it for all adsorbents and um, you can use it for a lot of very standardized measurements, uh, isotherms that you record with volumetric instruments. Um, Darren Broom will also talk more about high pressure measurements. Um, it is not yet ready to be used for mixture adsorption isotherms, but uh, I would say um, it is it is uh, quite developed. Um, um, maybe we should not call it mature, but uh, quite developed. Dan, would you like to comment on this further? or Just very briefly, um, a, a recent addition to the AIS specification is a, an additional field called the audit version. And since we're doing everything in GitHub and, and Git as our as our version control management, the recommendation is to put the the uh, the digest of the commit hash as the audit version, and then your AIF file is traceable back to a particular instance of the GitHub repository. And so then, if there is a major change in the vocabulary of AIF, we should at least be able to see where that change happened, and we and then the file that you have could be reviewed with respect to that previous specification. Mm -hmm. Okay. Here's a very specific question. Um, thanks a lot for your interesting information, but I need to know how I can model the adsorption of phenolic compounds by adsorption if I have a lot of molecules in liquid with different concentration because you are talking about gases, but my interest is in liquid state. Uh, it could be DFT and MD calculation suitable to describe uh, adsorption mechanism. I think this refers a bit to the question of liquid phase adsorption isotherms. Maybe this question is too specific. Um, per, perhaps the, the the person asking the question could contact me offline. Um, we have put effort at NIST into including liquid phase adsorption in our database. However, there are some significant challenges uh, associated with digitizing liquid phase adsorption. It is, is has more uh, metadata requirements than gas phase adsorption. So I'm, I'd be happy to discuss that offline. Okay. Great. Okay, there's one more question by Merdat. I'm one. Oh, this is a long question. Uh, maybe Merdat, do you want to come maybe to the? I will make you one of the reference, and maybe it's easier to ask your question online. We just wait a few minutes. So there's a question about IAST selectivity. Meta, do you want to join us for a minute? Hello, it's Stefan. Thanks a lot. Uh, so my, my question was also a suggestion. So I was thinking about different ways uh, that uh, we could, I mean, or you could, or we could promote the application of uh, AIF because I think that, uh, as, as you all pointed out, it, it would be very useful. Uh, so, uh, I, I had a couple of suggestions in this regard. Uh, one would be the AIF, that, uh, AIF check that I said uh, could be used exactly similar to SIF check and can point some of the, the uh, misses in the quality of the data, even if it is not only it is not about cell consistency, but also it is about, for example, lack of uh, enough data points in low pressure region or anything else that uh, the experts in uh, adsorption world know that it is useful for some of the calculations, like uh, isostatic heat of uh, adsorption calculation. And uh, that can uh, come as warnings, similar to the different degrees of the warnings that we have for seek check. And that, that can be used also as a as uh, as a mean for reviewers to gauge the quality of the adsorption data, and that can be another incentive for the reviewers and the people that are receiving the adsorption uh, file 
to uh, promote the application of AIF. And something else that I thought that would be very uh, helpful to uh, promote the application of AIFs have, would be to mix this uh, with some of the tools that normally experimental research researchers like to use, and some of those that, for example, has already been by Paul and his collaborators uh, in uh, PyGaps. And if uh, there we like the application of AIF is uh, also motivated and encouraged, then uh, or like normally, for example, uh, the all of the absorption isotherms will be converted to AIFs and will be exported back to the to the user. Because many of the experimental researchers would like to have the isostatic heat of adsorption and IASD selectivities, and there are quite a few that have in-house codes for this. So uh, many of the many of experimental researchers are using like the uh, the codes that are developed by others, like pi gaps that has been developed by Paul. And uh, so this, I think, can be another way. To uh, like motivate researchers for uh, using and uh, working with AIFs. Uh, yes, and and the other ones would be that I, I saw that uh, Dan can uh, or other members of IUPAC team can kind of publish some of uh, the already problems that they. See. Uh, a, a little bit more documented version of uh, the presentation that Dan showed uh, to us uh, today, so as to highlight the uh, importance of uh, such uh, uh, such files and such uh, report of meta metadata, and how much we miss by uh, like uh, not reporting it in the in the correct manner. Uh, even if everything is uh, report uh, is is done correctly, as Dan pointed out, for the case of Henry coefficient calculation, I think that using digitizer and digitizing the data that has been already uh, converted to graph will uh, uh, make us lose a lot of useful information that we could get with already tabulated data. <clears throat> Thanks a lot, Stefan. Yeah, thank you, Merat. Uh, I think this is very valuable input. Maybe we should ask you to also uh, participate in the task group or uh, support us. I think uh, it's very good. Uh, anybody who wants to comment on, on this? Uh, Dan, your presentation was uh, called on. Do you want to comment on this? or? Well, maybe I feel inspired to write a short comment. Uh, and highlight some of these things and, and put, put, frame it in the context of how AIF is a solution. Or it could be a, perhaps a, 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 a motivation section of the of the paper that we will eventually write for pure and applied chemistry. Yeah. I think this is anyhow on the roadmap, of course, the UPAC task group will uh, submit a publication on this action and, and pure and applied uh, chemistry. And, and this could be part of it, of course. I think that's an important point, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think the additional features, I think this is also a very good point. Um, of course, this requires resources that we don't have at the moment uh, for programming. And um, so uh, this is maybe something to think about in the future, how this could be accomplished with open source code or, or uh, with with uh, shared uh, uh, facilities maybe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, are there more questions? I don't see more questions at the moment. Um, yeah, uh, Chimo. Just, yeah, I think there was a nice point this morning in the discussion, because when you see the isotherms, and I really enjoy the, the presentation from that, you see that sometimes they have confusion, they are confused in the supercritical and subcritical, so that's why it would be useful that they can identify these problems. And also, when you try to reproduce these isotherms and you try to compare them, of course, the activation conditions are important, and they are already recorded there in the in the in the file in the format. But also the the uh, the conditions, the equilibration conditions. This is something that was already discussed this morning. I think this is really important, and this is something that we already incorporate in the software. So I think because at the end this will define when you are going to problematic materials where you have narrow porosity. That will define the differences when you try to compare your material with someone that, that is already published. No? 
I think in a certain moment that will be extremely useful no? to incorporate all this information because that will complete like the whole image of how you did the isotherm and how these measurements were performed. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Very <clears throat> valuable contribution, of course. Yeah, thank you. Okay, I don't see further questions at the moment or contributions. Um, I think we don't need to um, adhere so strictly to the schedule. I think in the interest of time, I saw also some presentations might be longer. So I think what we can do is also we can start now with the application section, if that's okay for all of you. Um, I think our first one would be then uh, Chimo. So thank you for all the contributions from the panelists here and also thank you for the valuable questions and input from the participants. Then I think we continue here um, with uh, Silvestre Albero. I will make you the moderator. And then you should be able to share your slides. Then we continue with the applications and so we wanted to show a few applications basically with the uh, different type of materials. So we start with porous carbons. Can you see my screen? Yes. Sorry, I'm a bit... Okay. Okay, so thanks, uh, Stefan. Uh, the idea here was just to, to show some a couple of examples of, of carbon materials and how it's useful to have this uh, uni this universal format. To, to, to represent the, the, the absorption data. No? So when we when we perform the isotherms, uh, independently of the material that we are dealing with, no, we are always interested in learning about the textural properties of the system. So we need to understand how is the porosity, we need to understand how is the pore shape, the pore size, even we need to get values like the pore volume, mesopore volume, and then we have a, a, a number of uh, different uh, possibilities in order to extract this information from the isotherm. No? But in all the cases, what is clear is that we need to have high quality absorption data. No? And the first question that we always have is, which is the main probe that we have to use to characterize our material? No? So majority of us, we are using nitrogen absorption at 77K because this is just the most easy, uh, the most easy way to do this uh, textural characterization. Some years ago, I remember that Paco was always suggesting CO2 absorption at 273 because with CO2 absorption, you were able to identify or analyze more precisely the narrow porosity. And then we also have the possibility to use argon absorption, in this case at 87K. So those are three possibilities that we have in our normal labs that we can use for this characterization of these textural parameters that I'm showing here on the, on the screen. So basically what we want to, to, to get at the end is this type of isotherms that we have here. No? And in this presentation, I would like to emphasize how important is the low relative pressure range. Because there we have all the information about the filling of these narrow micropores. And those are, these, those are problems that we have in our daily life. No? When we develop carbon materials or we develop MOFs or zeolites, sometimes we have cavities where we have kinetic restrictions. So that's why it's very useful to combine different probes because then we can learn if our material is performing in a good way or not. No? And I remember before in the, in the examples that Dan was showing that there was a mistake in the reporting of the temperature, but sometimes also we can see that the capacity is improved when we increase the absorption temperature because we have kinetic limitation when we are performing the isotherm at the lower pressure. No? So, Sometimes we can be against thermodynamics because we are having problems with the accessibility of the material. So as I was mentioning, at the end, we want to get this beautiful isotherm. This is argon data in three different carbon materials. And as I say, you know, this section here is extremely important because we have all the information about the micropore field. You know? In this case, this is a paper that we did just made a few years ago. The idea was to prepare carbon materials, as you can see here, with a very narrow porosity. So we were trying to, to find materials where we have a priori problems of accessibility for nitrogen. No? You can see here in this screen, I was comparing the pore volume from nitrogen, the V0. And then, I, I don't know if you can see it on the final column, because I have problems with the, in the screen, I cannot see it. 
but we were comparing with the final column where you have the micropore volume obtained from the CO2 isotope. So you see that in these three samples, the values, they are relatively close. That means that the narrow porosity and the whole microporosity is, is the same. So those are materials where we have narrow constriction. So as I told you, those, that was a paper that we were just uh, designing using olive stones. The idea was to make a carbonization and then try to do a very small activation. So we were working with 8%, 19, and 34% of activation. And the idea was to develop these narrow micropores and to see how they can be evaluated combining different probes. So here, well, we have here the nitrogen isotherms. As you can imagine, whenever we increase the activation degree, we are increasing the amount of nitrogen absorbed. But you can see that in these three samples that I was showing before, the 8, 19, and 34 uh, burn off, you can see that the nitrogen isotherm has a narrow need. So that means that this is a confirmation that we have materials where the majority of the porosity is extremely narrow. And then we are in this area where we can have problems of accessibility, or at least we are in an area where we have to be careful in the characterization of the, of the system. At that time, we wanted to compare what happens when we combine nitrogen and argon, because we knew from the literature that, for instance, material like zeolite or more, where you have a highly polar surface, always the absorption of argon is shifted to higher relative pressures. And this is because there are important differences in between the nitrogen and the argon. First of all, nitrogen is a diatom diatomic molecule, while argon is monatomic. So for the estimation of the structure of parameters, argon is much more easy. In addition, we have that the boiling temperature of argon is slightly higher. So we go from 77 to 87 K. So in case that we have kinetic limitations, these 10 degrees, is, they are also important because we can have better accessibility, so better kinetics. In addition, yeah, we, we have a very important difference with nitrogen. We have a dipolar moment, a quadrupolar moment, sorry. While in the case of argon, we don't have any type of dipolar or quadrupolar moment. So the interactions of the nitrogen with the, with the structure, they are promoted as compared to argon. And as I told you, when we did the same comparison in this case with a carbon material, where we have a relatively inner surface, we could see the same effect. The micropore filling is shifted to lower relative pressure when we use nitrogen. And this is because there are these specific interactions in between the nitrogen molecule, the quadrupole moment, and the surface of the carbon. So you see that with argon, we have a better correlation in between the pressure where the micropore filling is taking place and the pore size of the system. So there was a big difference, as I say, even with that carbon material, which is relatively in it when we were comparing nitrogen and argon. So it's clear that in this case, we were able to prepare these carbon materials where we had these narrow constrictions. The microphore filling of these narrow micropores takes place at a higher relative pressure when we were using argon. And this is due to this uh, enhanced absorption potential and enhanced interaction of the nitrogen with the porosity. So let's say that if we want to make a more accurate determination of the microporosity, argon has some advantages because we avoid these specific interactions with the surface. No? So at that time we had the, the, the idea that we had is that we, of course, using nitrogen at 77K is a perfect uh, probe molecule. We can get the apparent surface area, a specific pore volume. Also the CO2 that was proposed in 1982 is very useful because we can learn about the narrow porosity. So in this case with CO2, we have a higher temperature for the absorption measurement. So all these kinetic restrictions, they are completely removed. But of course, argon has some advantages. And that way we were, we were recommending argon absorption at 87K for the detailed analysis of the narrow microporosity. We were also wondering if we can use this absorption data to estimate the pore size distribution, which at the end is just the most graphical way to see how is the porosity of our material. So again, we were trying to compare the non-local and the quintessential DFT applied to this argon and nitrogen data. No? So this is just uh, for general knowledge, and I'm sure that all of you, you know that. Originally, they were developing the non-local DFT. So the, the non-local is considering the surface like more homogeneous. So they are considering homogeneous graphite-like planes, while the quintessential is more realistic because it's considering the surface is considering the heterogeneity of the surface of the carbon material. 
So you can see that when we do the fitting of the isotherm using the non-local and the quench solid, you see that the blue one is better fitting the absorption data. So the quench solid, where you are taking into account the surface roughness, is more realistic in the fitting of the absorption data in both cases, no? in logarithmic scale no? for the nitrogen data. Even here, you can see this is an amplification of this uh, fitting. You can see that when you apply the non-local, you have these steps. And these steps is because this uh, model is uh, considering the layering transition, while in the case of the coin solid, as you are considering the surface as a heterogeneous, you have a much more better fitting of the, of the absorption data. So that means that the, the coin solid is a better uh, method for the fitting of the nitrogen isotherm in order to obtain this pore size distribution. No? That is, as I, as I told you before, is very useful. No? So here you have the comparison for argon and nitrogen. No? Applying this, uh, in this case, the non-local DFT to the absorption data that they were showing before. No? So you can see that the performance is rather similar when we are above one nanometer. But when we are below the one nanometer, you see that the argon data, they give a more precise description of the microporosity. So that means that if you can choose in between the two molecules, the advantages that you have with the argon, they are more, they will give you more accurate data about the, 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 the description of the porosity in your system. As you can see here, we are using the non-local. So when you have the non-local due to this uh, layer in transition, you have this, artif this artificial minima, for instance, the one in one nanometer, this is not realistic because as I told you before, the non-local is considering the surface as homogeneous. And then this layer in transition that I was showing before is making this artificial minimum. So if you have the option, the quench solid is more realistic because it's considering the surface like uh, uh, heterogeneous. And that's why when you compare the quench solid for nitrogen and argon, you can see that now you don't have this artificial minimum, which is a, uh, important improvement and when you compare the nitrogen with the argon you can see that with when we, with the argon you can have a more precise profile of the porosity in your material so at the end the message is that you both probes are useful for the characterization of the micro porosity in this case in carbon materials but if you are going to problematic system materials where you have really narrow pores a combination of the three probes is important and in this case Using argon has several advantages because you can have a more perfect correlation of the micropore filling with the pressure of the system. And then this is an exercise that I was doing this week. The question is, okay, and this is something that we were already seeing this morning. So can we extract information about the pore structure when we have the isotherms published in the literature? And I put you, those are the argon data that I was showing before. So if I publish them in logarithmic scale, as you can see here, then this is very useful for the for the scientists because the digitalization of this isotherm is much more easy but the majority of us usually we are publishing in linear scale and you will see now that when we publish in linear scale and you try to go to these uh, digitalization systems or programs you will see that it gets immediately crazy because the system is not able to extract the data that we have here in the vertical jump no? So as I told you, this is something that I was doing this during this week because I wanted to show you how is the information that we can get when we apply this uh, digitalization. No? I was using this program here, the Webplot Digitalizer, and as I told you, I was trying to fit a potential isotherm that is published in logarithmic scale, like the one here, and I was trying to do the same with the linear scale. No? So with the logarithmic scale, and this is just the, the screenshot of the program, you see that I can, I can do a really good fitting of the isotherm. No? Here you can see that both of them, they are overlapping. If I do it in, a, in, a, in, a, in an origin file, you can see the brown is the, the, the data fitting and the red is the real data. No? So you can see that when I use the logarithmic plot to do the fitting, both of them, logarithmic and linear, they have, you can see that they have a very good agreement in between the digitalized uh, data and the real values. Even here, you can see in the logarithmic scale, I have a really good fitting of the data. What happens if I publish the isotherm in linear scale? So again, when I do this digitalization, you can see that apparently the fitting is really good. You can see the points here, the, the, the red, the, the brown ones, they are the digitalized and the red on the back, they are the real data. 
but the question is what happens when now I take this data and I put it in my computer no? and I try to compare them. In linear scale, everything is perfect. You can see that the fitting is really good. But the problem is when I go to logarithmic scale, and this is something that we were already discussing this morning, you can see that the real data are here and the digitalized isotherm is just not showing what is going on at, at really low relative pressure. Even when you go to the file, you see that the system is completely mistaken because you don't have a progressive fitting of the data increasing pressure. So the system is just jumping and giving you different data because it's not able to identify what is happening in the vertical jump of the isotherm. And now the question is what happens if I take this data and I try to apply, for instance, the quench solid to obtain information about the porosity of the system. No? So here in the top you have the quench solid DFT fitting of this uh, DD19 carbon using the, the original data. So you can see that we have a perfectly well-defined uh, profile for the microporous structure. When I apply the digitalization to the logarithmic scale, the situation is not that bad, but you can see that I don't have the same quality of the fitting. So at the end, I don't get the same quality of the pore size distribution. And of course, if I go to the digit to the linear digit digitalization, you can see that the profile is useless. I mean, at the end, I don't get information about the porosity of my material. So at the end, I think the message is really clear. I mean, incorporating the original data in the publications using this uh, AIF format is extremely useful because then we can we can obtain this data from our colleagues and then we can have a very good comparison with our isotherm. And just to finish, I would like to give this a uh, small tip because for the people that you are using Quantachrome, or at least this is the problem that I was facing, when you make the isotherm, usually you get these three files. You have the QPS and then you have two of them which are text files. So when you go to the, to the online platform to do the conversion of the isotherm to the AIF, you see that in Quantachrome, you have to use the text file. So the important thing is that you have to use always what is called the raw analysis data. Because if you try to do the same conversion with the, with the file that is called isotherm, you will get an error message. So at least this is the problem that I was facing. So as I say, use the raw analysis data, put it in the Quantachrome text, you draw the file here, and at the end, you will get this beautiful isotherm. And as, Dan, as uh, Jack was showing this morning, at the end, you will get all the information about this isotherm with all the description of, of all the details, plus the absorption data, and below you have the desorption data. And then at the end, just to finish, well, I would like to, to remind again that argon absorption of data K in combination with the application of non-local or quench solid will provide, or will give you a reliable characterization of the microporosity in materials where you have narrow constrictions. This that, that data digitalization is extremely important because if not, you will not be able to produce or provide accurate data, at least at low relative pressure uh, regimes. And the incorporation of these files in the publications or even in the repositories, this is something that we have to get used to do because then everyone in the field will be able to extract accurate and reliable data from our material in the whole relative pressure range. No? And with this, I would like to thank you for, uh, for your attention. Yeah, uh, Timo, th thank you very much for this great overview and uh, very detailed presentation. Um, there is already one question. Um, why do we use, uh, why do we do adsorption of CO2 at 273 Kelvin, but for nitrogen at 77 Kelvin? Well, in the case of CO2, it was proposed, as I say, in 1982, because CO2 at uh, at this 273 is extremely good for the characterization of the narrow microporosity. So usually when you apply to being in radius to the to the CO2 absorption data, and the point is that the relative pressure that you are, the relative pressure range that you are analyzing when you go from zero to one bar is only from zero to 0 0.03. So you are stopping the isotherm at really low relative pressure. That's why all the information that you are getting there concerns only the narrow microporosity. And for us, it was very useful to compare the CO2 data with the nitrogen because with the CO2, we were getting narrow microporosity data. While in the case of nitrogen, we were observing microporosity, the whole microporosity plus the meso. So this comparison was very useful as I showed at the beginning 
to identify materials where you have problems because when co2 is giving you more volume than nitrogen this is unrealistic because the narrow micropore volume cannot be bigger than the total micropore volume and this is because co2 has higher accessibility than nitrogen so for us the comparison was extremely useful to identify immediately kinetic problems for nitrogen to access the porosity at 77 k yeah, very good there was one question on the link for the raw to irf uh, page but i sent it already so someone wanted an update are there more questions for this presentation on the carbon materials i don't see more questions at the moment we can wait a few more minutes it seems everybody's happy so then thank you very much thank Timo. You. thank you for the great presentation and great commitment and then we come to our next speaker professor sida keskin from kosh university sida i will make you the moderator you should be able to share your slides now We can see your screen now. Ah, but your microphone is off, maybe. Yeah. Are you able to see right now? Yes, looks great. Yes, wonderful. Okay, great. Thank you for the uh, nice organization. I think it has been a very, very useful workshop. So I will be talking about why the digital... Let me see. I think my screen has gone. Yeah, we can see it now. Okay, I think uh, I wasn't able to change the slide, but right now I guess I'm able to show. Okay, so we will be talking about how absorption information file is useful, especially when it comes to modeling metal organic frameworks. So in my group, we are basically using molecular simulations to understand uh, fundamental knowledge about the material properties, mainly for metal organic frameworks. And what we do is to use high throughput molecular simulation methods based on Monte Carlo and molecular dynamics to identify the best, the most promising materials so that we can direct the experimentally valuable efforts, time and resources to those important uh, materials. So metal organic frameworks, uh, in my opinion, are one of the best materials to study gas absorption and gas separation because they have the uh, fascinating properties like very high surface area and porosity, the lowest density among all crystalline materials. And um, chemists have the ability to produce a lot of materials having various pore sizes and functionalities. You can see from this figure that the number of metal organic frameworks is increasing at an unpredicted rate exponentially and we are currently aware of hundred thousands of different synthesized MOFs in addition to millions of hypothetical MOFs that I'm not going to talk today. So uh, practically it is not possible to study gas storage in every single synthesized MOFs using trial and error experiments or brute force molecular simulations. So in this perspective, high throughput computational simulations are very useful uh, because with this molecular simulations, we can quickly screen large number of MOFs and we can identify the best materials for different types of gas storage and gas separation applications. So here we have some examples, air separation, hydrogen purification, CO2 capture from natural gas and flue gas, noble gas purification. All these applications require to compute gas absorption properties of MOFs for simple gas molecules like oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen, methane, or CO2. So what we do, what we have been doing in the past uh, decade, we were taking the crystallographic information files, SIFs, 
uh, from the literature, either from experimental papers or from Cambridge Structural Database. And then we were feeding them into our computer to run Monte Carlo simulations and to compute Gazap text. So for example, at the right hand side, uh, we have a pretty old data from uh, 2010 when we first showed that, in fact, MOFs can outperform zeolites and activated carbons, which are commercial materials in industry for gas storage. And uh, we were able to show that with molecular simulations, we can um, produce the absorption data accurately. When it comes to accurate molecular simulation, we need to really compare the molecular simulation data with the experimentally available literature data. In fact, uh, I used to make the same joke in my presentations. There is always this reviewer too asking to compare simulation results with the available experimental data of MOFs. So here you see three different figures. And in each figure, actually, we are comparing experimental data that we collected from the literature with the simulation data that we produce as a result of high throughput computational screening. So on the y-axis, we have experimental data for CO2 uptake, uh, I guess at one bar and room temperature. On the mid in the middle, we have the ideal selectivities for CO2 methane and CO2 nitrogen separation. And on the right hand, we have CO2 hydrogen selectivity data. Again, collected from different experimental group, from literature, and on the x-axis, we have our uh, simulations. And in the middle uh, graph, we actually name some of the MOFs. So we used to show some experimental versus simulation data comparison for gas absorption and for ideal selectivities. This was how we actually uh, convinced the readers that we are doing molecular simulations accurately. So if we can convince the readers about the accuracy of our molecular simulations, then the next step is to do the simulations for thousands of MOFs for which experimental, uh, experimentally measured absorption data is not available. And then we can identify the best materials and we can uh, direct uh, us to do experimental understanding. So molecular simulation inputs such as force fields, potential parameters, cycle numbers, partial charge assignment methods, these are generally selected by comparing with the experimental data. So therefore, reading experimental absorption data is very critical for us. Reading it accurately is very critical for us. And in fact, before the absorption information file, before AAF, um, the current, let's say, scientific reporting in graphs wasn't adequate enough for us because we were introducing some bias when we read this data. So I will show some examples uh, from this. So this is the before AAF phase. Uh, we used to read the absorption data. I was uh, lucky that Albert already showed the plot digitizers. In fact, most of my students used to use the digitizers to read the absorption data. So let's see one case. Uh, this is uh, Stefan's group. Uh, I think this is a DU232 material. So I asked uh, four of my students to read the uh, absorption data for nitrogen, just looking at this experimentally uh, reported figure. And uh, I didn't show them the AF file. So the first student just, you know, used the plot digitizer and read only four data points. The second student made the reading in the same region, but she actually produced much more. She read much more data points. Another student uh, actually tried to read from the low pressure regime, which was difficult to read. Remember the, the figure? So at the low pressure regime, it is a little bit difficult to read in this format. And for students, uh, he actually took a lot of data points, but you can see that there are uh, some fluctuations between the data points. And look, this is the absorption information file. Smooth, a lot of data points, and most importantly, at low pressure, we have the data. So this is our the 
pink uh, boxes are our simulation results for this material. And if I didn't use the IAF, and if I was working with my third student, the green data points, I would think that simulations are underestimating the experimental data. So I would go back and change the simulation input. But with the AAF, we were able to understand if we are doing okay or not compared to the experiments. Another uh, example, I think this was again uh, the figure that we have seen in the beginning of the introduction of the workshop, a DU26. So again, the first student this time took more data points, second student, some uncertainties with the digitizer. Third student using digitizer, uh, he was again uh, dedicated to go to the low pressure region. Fourth student, she has a lot of uncertainty and she doesn't have data at low pressure region. And AAF is actually showing all the data that we weren't able to read before from the graph using the digitizer. Uh, again, our simulation data is here, and I actually wanted to show you an example where simulations are also failing because simulations may fail too. So here, for example, we were overestimating the high pressure absorption data, although we were good at the low pressure region. And now we can go back and try to understand what the simulations are missing in the high pressure region. So I think these examples are clarifying that uh, AAF is important to set the simulations accurately. Because if we can set the simulations accurately, then we can use them to predict gas absorption and separation properties of remaining MOVs, which haven't been experimentally studied, maybe because of time or budget limitations. So for example, here we have two figures. Uh, those are just the results of high throughput computational screening showing ideal selectivity of uh, I guess 5,500 different types of synthesized MOFs for which experimentally measured absorption data is not available. So we actually produced this data uh, which weren't experimentally uh, available before. Now we can look at the promising materials offering high selectivity and we can focus on those promising materials. So uh, this is like the computational modeling of MOFs, like a brief historical background. So let's see where we were and now where we are. Uh, I think back in 2003, we have seen the first Monte Carlo simulation for methane absorption in isoretical uh, MOF1. And in 2004, we started to do simulations for uh, a few MOFs, but mostly the interest was in iron MOFs and uh, ZIF materials. And starting with 2010s, uh, with the introduction of a lot of MOF databases, we started to work with high throughput computational screening. And now we are in uh, 2023 and I think now we are at the point that even with high throughput computational screening, we can study every single MOF. Even if a novel MOF is synthesized, uh, studying this MOF for many different applications involving adsorption is practically not possible. So uh, a lot of experimental data is existing for some materials. Simulation data is existing and growing for MOFs. So I think now it's it's the point that we need to also report the simulated absorption data in the AF format, something that we discussed in the beginning. And I think this is going to also open a door for another modeling part, machine learning. Now we are actually using high throughput computational screening together with machine learning so that uh, we can actually use the simulation data to train machine learning models. And if we have the open access experimental and simulated absorption data of MOFs somewhere, then this would greatly extend the use of machine learning in the, in the field of uh, MOFs. So my final words related with the AAF is, uh, I think similar efforts will be needed for the simulated absorption data. And combining both the experimental and simulated gas absorption data to develop uh, AI-based, machine learning-based models will be very, very important to unlock the potential of MOFs in absorption processes. And 
uh, regardless of the application, development of this type of adsorption databases will be very important for the future uh, material design. And uh, there will be a need for combined efforts coming from simulators, theoreticians, and experimentalists. So with that, I'm going to end my uh, presentation and I will be happy to get any questions. Yeah, thank you, Zeta, for this uh, great and very impressive uh, presentation. I think it was very impressive to see uh, how the manual uh, uh, difficulties are very different from student to student. And um, I think it was also interesting to, for me to see that basically the, the uptake of the DOT-8 was a little bit different in your simulation than in the experiment, which of course could also mean that maybe our compound uh, still could reach a higher surface area if uh, it is not properly activated that could also be a reason and um, and this is also a little bit my dream of course that um, my students have access to all your AIF simulated files and can compare easily their experimental data also with your theoretical data I think um, this will be very helpful in the future mm -hmm. okay are there any questions yeah there is one question um, is it possible to perform the same approach for other non or semi-crystalline porous materials such as coughs and pops, POPs? Yeah, we, we also do the same thing for coughs. Today, I focus on MOFs since we have a lot of data. Uh, we also do the same thing for coughs, but yeah, with coughs, we are a little bit limited because there are only 500, uh, I think 562 types of synthesized coughs. So the available experimentally reported gas absorption data is really very limited for coughs. Uh, but uh, we have some comparison between simulations and experiments for coughs. Uh, I, I think I have seen this in the questions right now in the chat box. So I would like to drop a small and quick note here. Uh, I totally agree with one of the questions coming uh, about comparing simulations against a single experimental data set may may not be in, uh, sufficient. This is one of the comments that I see in the chat box. I totally agree. Therefore, uh, if I remind you this figure um, in the middle and in the middle figure, you can see that the same material is existing at different places. The same material, for example, UIO 66, synthesized by different groups having different purities and or activation steps. And then as a result, their CO2 uptake may be different. Therefore, uh, we are not getting the experimental data from one single experimental group, but we are trying to compare our simulation results with the material synthesized by all possible groups in the world if they reported their absorption data. So I think uh, hopefully this will answer your question, Miguel. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, this was a comment by uh, Miguel, uh, but he put it in the uh, speakers list. Yes, there's another one. Uh, question. Um, can we do these simulations for absorption at very high pressure, let's say 80 bar for MOFs? Yes, uh, we can do. In the examples that I showed you today, we were mostly uh, looking at CO2 separation. So we were looking maximum of 10 bar for natural gas and flue gas separation. But yes, we can do up to 80 bar, uh, even up to 100 bar. Um, the difficulty here is as we increase the pressure, the time for the equilibration uh, is increasing. So computational requirement is increasing when we go to the higher pressures. Uh, so I, I'm hoping that in this part, uh, artificial intelligent methods trained based on the previous simulation data will be useful. Um, what will be the best format for simulated adsorption isotherm data, CSV or TXT, to be able to convert to AIF? Because in the website, there is no conversion platform for simulated adsorption data. Um, I think we need to think about the output of the simulation. For example, in my group, we are using RASPA, mainly RASPA, uh, but I know many simulators are using their homemade uh, codes, not package programs to run Monte Carlo. So um, maybe reporting the uh, RASPA, 
translating the RASPA output or, I don't know, material studio output, commercial package programs output to uh, AAF would be the starting point. But then we have to think about how to uh, translate the other outputs of other simulators, which are not in the RASPA output form, uh, to the um, AAF format. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. So, yeah, we mentioned this in the beginning, RASPA has already the AIF output uh, option, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So maybe we also need to discuss this in the task group, maybe um, with um, Veronique, if, if there's other, um, yeah, if we can generate another uh, converter basically for other formats, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, what is the role of framework flexibility in the simulations? Yeah, it's a very good question. And again, this must be our reviewer three. We receive this question very often. Uh, in the high throughput molecular uh, simulations, we generally start with the rigid materials. So we assume that all MOFs are rigid at their uh, reported crystallographic position. And then we identify the best materials. And then only for the best materials, we are doing flexible simulations because obviously flexible simulations require definition and validation of uh, force fields showing the flexibility of the material. On the other hand, there are some cases that we directly start with the flexible simulations because we know that the material is naturally flexible. We have the experimental um, knowledge about this. So in this case, we start with the flexible simulation. Currently, our experience is that Flexibility has a pronounced effect when it comes to diffusivity, not necessarily for gas absorption. It is affecting adsorption in some materials, but not in all MOFs. But when it comes to diffusion or gas permeability, flexibility is very important because it's obviously changing the pore size of the material. Very good. I think, uh, Zeta, with this, we would like to thank you very much. We have to move on to the next presentation. Thank you for the great presentation. Thank you. And then uh, we continue with Vladimir Bonn. Vladimir Bonn is a habilitant uh, and group leader at TU Dresden and MyLab, and he will also give some insights into experimental work. So, uh, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for a kind introduction. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, I. Uh, in my presentation, I will uh, emphasize the uh, importance of... Um, uh, uh, Vladimir, you have to go to Anzeige Einstellung and then uh, switch. Yes. Well, no. Like this, yeah, right? Good. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So, uh, yeah, on the importance of digitalization of adsorption data in MOF research, uh, in particular, um, yeah, we know that uh, the condition on which MOF it was synthesized, or, or how how the how the MOF uh, or porous material was treated, also very important for um, adsorption. Um, and uh, yeah, in in this presentation, I will share with you one of other recent studies where uh, this activation or how we call it, activation or desolation conditions are very crucial for uh and it has a really great um, influence on, on absorption data we, we get uh, at the end yeah so um, recently we designed a metal organic framework or two basically metal organic frameworks uh, based on this uh, tetracarboxylate ligands with uh, two different um, uh, backbones uh, flexible backbones one of them containing uh, this uh, double uh, uh, CC bond and one of them uh, uh, other bond. Uh, we could uh, synthesize this and, uh, in single crystals. Uh, in this case, one blue blue color and here the green one. And uh, yeah, a combination of with uh, copper pedal wheels uh, leads to to a three dimensional crystal structure, uh, which. Uh, which uh, contain uh, cavities, so the porosity uh, should be there. So we here um, are some pro projection of this, uh, a different projection of this um, uh, morph uh, crystal structure. So the pores are quite large. Uh, 
and uh, yeah, it's, uh, uh, both of them uh, crystallize in our thrombic space group with quite large unit cell. And what we did for first, uh, we calculate the geometrical porosity and realize, okay, both of them should be porous with quite remarkable porosity with surface area um, more than 4,000 uh, square meters per gram and uh, so, uh, very yeah, relatively high uh, pore volume. Uh, and basically what and uh, but what we realized after activation we tried uh, uh, first uh, conventional dissolution in vacuum but also a supercritical activation what we realized that after uh, exchange uh, to acetone the crystal structure uh, remain uh, unchanged but then we uh, after after the supercritical activation so we uh, the material remains still crystalline, but uh, we lose uh, obviously the uh, high order uh, reflections. Um, and what we see here is uh, that the color changed from 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 um, uh, blue to green. So something was happened with a framework, uh, and uh, basically uh, when we measured the nitrogen adsorption isotherm, which is the first uh, the usual technique we uh, to to evaluate the porosity we, we observed only minor uptake like 15 uh, square uh, cubic uh, centimeter per gram which was uh, actually not expected uh, and uh, yeah for 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 this uh, and and therefore this activation conditions are very very important uh, so in 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 a file we can we can uh, all we can input uh, all these uh, conditions in, in, in the co uh, corresponding um, lines like adsorption the gas summary so it's supercritical co2 the gas temperature 308 because we go over a critical point and we've also put the uh, the gas time right uh, but yeah because since we have only low uptake so obviously the framework uh, collapsed um, uh, to some not 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 porous state or the pores were not accessible anymore for nitrogen and we thought okay how can we uh, maybe retain the porosity and uh, what we did this next we we tried to uh, use uh, another conditions namely uh, we we flow um, we we activate uh, uh, this um, material dut 202 in an argon flow at room temperature for 30 minutes and what we observed that uh, the color remain blue which was already a good sign and uh, yes and then after that we we realized uh, using different spectroscopic technique like in nmr ir ir spectroscopy tg that uh, some dmf molecules which uh, which which were coordinated to pedalers but also molecules which were um, located in this small cavity so very important to to remain the uh, crystal structure and as we will see in the next slide also the porosity of this framework so basically uh, small changes in the activation or dissolution conditions lead to 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 a huge changes uh, in in in, a, in the porosity of this MOF. so basically if if we use uh, uh, argon flow uh, five uh, milliliter per minute uh, at room temperature for half an hour uh, we get uh, a much uh, higher uh, pore volume uh, compared to what to to even to supercritical uh, drying uh, which which is which is known as a very mild uh, dissolution technique in MOF chemistry so then uh, later uh, we we also tried uh, different activation times in vacuum and what we see in uh, one hour in in the dynamic vacuum uh, reduce uh, the pore volume from 500 to 300 uh, cubic centimeter per gram and then uh, at three hours we are already at 100 cubic centimeters per gram and then further increasing um, uh, the uh, vacuum treatment leads to to to, to nearly non-porous uh, solid right 
And here, for example, we can, for each isotherm, we can include this uh, activation conditions, vacuum 10 pascal, uh, so the temperature and then uh, the gas time. In this case, it's one hour, right? So with that, uh, yeah, one, the same material shows different porosity depending on uh, the solvation conditions. And this is very important to, uh, to 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 um, save in 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 a, in a, in a so or archive in in a, I, I I have file uh, in in using these uh, options we have here. So uh, another point I wanted to uh, go a bit uh, emphasize is uh, we are also working on in situ XRD development on instrumentation at synchrotron, but also in the lab. I don't want to go into technical details. We're developing uh, different uh, kind of uh, in situ cells, um, but in principle, what we are, what we can do is uh, we can measure XRD patterns at the different points of adsorption isotherm upon uh, adsorption or desorption branch, and uh, what we are getting then. Uh, it's, something like this so we, we we get adsorption isotherm and at some po uh, defined points we we, we get uh, this uh, powder x-ray diffraction patterns here i try to uh, like highlight it with color using uh, colors so where at which point we which phase we we exist uh, so here we have a contraction this is an example of duty 49 uh, copper and ethylene adsorption. So first we, we observe a contraction to, to, to contracted pore phase and after that uh, reopening. But uh, again, after, after we publish the data, uh, probably some users will don't have um, access to, to, to a raw data and uh, in particular, it, yeah, it will be not so easy to assign the adsorption points to, to, to the XRD. So the, therefore I wanted again to, to emphasize the linking of this uh, uh, adsorption points to some other techniques, maybe not only with XRD, but some people are working on uh, in situ spectroscopy uh, like NMR or IR. And yeah, this will be also important to 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 maybe in, in the future to 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 link uh, adsorption uh, data to some uh, other techniques. So uh, yeah, with that, uh, I, I I just summarized that uh, yeah, adsorption information file is an important tool for digitalization, unification, and reporting of adsorption data, implementation of dissolvation conditions, uh, which in this case is, is extremely important in AIF file, improves the reproducibility of adsorption data. I think there are also many other moths in the literature uh, for yeah, the adsorption isotherms and uptake and surface area report, they are like very different depending on conditions, uh, how a sample was handled. So, and then the uh, possibility of linking of adsorption data with XRD uh, may be helpful for reporting of adsorption data coupled with uh, other analytical techniques. And with that, thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you, uh, Vladimir, for this very nice overview and also for this nice example showing how the different uh, dissolvation conditions can be implemented in the AIF format. Um, I'm waiting a little bit. For, oh yeah, there's already one question. Um, thank you for the excellent presentation. You just mentioned the difference between a uh, supercritical drying method and argon flow method. May I ask whether the pre-activated MOF was in DMF solvent? Uh, no, it was not in DMF solvent. Uh, DMF just uh, uh, very st uh, strongly trapped in this uh, small pore. So uh, even after exchange to acetone, uh, we observe uh, DMF uh, in, in this uh, small cage and this is a precondition. So this basically this DMF molecules uh, stabilize the uh, structure. So if we remove them, the structure collapse and we don't have porosity anymore. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, there's one more question, but it's difficult for me to understand what gives PXRS, uh, probably PXRD as exact information. 
Um, so this is a technique that we develop here where we analyze PXRD in parallel to adsorption and the PXRD gives the information um, on the structure basically. So yeah, this is the yes. slide, yeah. Yes, exactly. And you mentioned so, how we can link this together. Of course, this is quite a challenge. I mean, um, in the PXRD data, the PDF is uh, uh, an important reporting format, right? The powder diffraction file. So maybe that's an option to think about linking the PDF to the AIF format, but um, yeah, but could, could be In principle, we, we can also uh, represent XRD also as a XY file or CSV, it's also possible, but yeah. I'm not sure yeah. how, it, how it can be unified with uh, with uh, AAF format. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, maybe something to think about how to connect the yes. different experimental data. Okay, great. Okay, I don't see, ah, there's one more question, very nice presentation about the activation part, how it is performed, the argon flow activation. So it's uh, just uh, the MOF was uh, uh, in 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 a, in a Schlang tube uh, in a frit I think, and then we just flow argon uh, through for half an hour, and I think such such technique is also yeah we, we, we yeah that's that's also a technical uh, how 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 we how we did it basically we just mm -hmm. flow the argon over over through the uh, uh, free it with uh, MOF and in mm -hmm. half an hour of the acetone, like, uh, so we, we just uh, saturate the uh, argon with acetone vapor and then get an equilibrium. So the pores are then acetone mm -hmm. evaporate and the DMF remains in the pore, so. Yeah. Then yes. there's one question. Can are you able to do high pressure in situ XRD up to 60 bar? Uh that can we do only at synchrotron, but in principle, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, in the interest of time, I think we have to go on. Thank you very much, uh Vladimir, for this great presentation. And then we come to Paul Yakomi from SMS um about the data visualization. Paul, I will make you the moderator. So you should be able to share your slides now. Uh, your micro is still off, I think. Working now? Yes, now we can hear you, yeah. Great, great, super. Just need to get this out of the speaker. Okay. Great. Um, yes. So, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Paul Yakomi. Uh, I'm a senior product scientist at Surface Measurement Systems. And I'd like to start by quickly thanking the drivers behind the AIF standardization project. Uh, it's really an honor to be part and to contribute to this initiative. What I'd like to talk about is a little bit about the future potential of AIF as a format. So when thinking about different data standardizations in absorption, we can identify several areas where best practices can improve our community. Both, uh, both Stefan and Jack and other panelists have previously made a very strong case for the requirement for standardization and discussed at length. I'd just like to try to compartmentalize it a bit. So um, the way I see absorption standardization can be divided into measurement, so measurement of absorption data, further processing, uh, then afterwards sharing of data to, to others uh, or um, publications, and finally storage, uh, long-term storage either in, in databases or in submissions to journals. Now, there have been multiple works which highlight possible issues for absorption measurements, which push for improvements like IUPAC guidelines, NIST interlaboratory studies, journal articles, white papers from major equipment manufacturers. So, um, I'd like to 
hope that so far the measurement has been the area which has seen the most standardization. Um, so indeed, unless you're building the desorption instrumentation apparatus from scratch, currently available instrumentation is highly accurate. Um, the AIF places an emphasis on adsorption data sharing through standardization of how an isotherm is, is depicted, is saved, um, and up until now, hopefully you're already very familiar with. The centralized storage of adsorption data has also been envisaged, um, such as experimental data in an ISODB database, and uh, uh, you will hear a little bit uh, more from uh, Dan Sidarius later down the line. Uh, but also from various initiatives from other groups for simulation or modeling data like EPFL, Northwesterns, or uh, we've heard uh, earlier from the presentation. Um, however, the, sub the, the subsequent topic of actual processing of the data is one topic which has often been left to the sidelines. So let's say the raw absorption data is fully available as an AIF. Um, now what? That's half the story, as often what's reported is further treatment of the data, surface area, pore size distributions, uh, processing for multi-component uh, predictions. This is also being touched by Zemo in his presentation. Um, for those who have not seen it, I'd like to point out this uh, recent uh, publication from David Fire and Jimenez Group in Cambridge. Um, in brief, it was an interlaboratory study where groups were sent isotherms and tasked to calculate BT surface area of some materials. So these are the distributions of BT areas that, uh, that were reported. And you can see that some materials, it seems like a distribution of reported BT areas of more than a thousand of meters squared. Um, to stress, this was the case of here is an isotherm, please calculate the surface area and report the data. Um, so, there is a debate whether BET area is anything more than a fingerprint for some of these materials, um, but I think we can all agree that given the same isotherm, we should have a way to obtain the same fingerprint, the same data. So this really highlights that some numbers uh, that are reported in the publication might, should also include the way that the data was processed, what DT ranges were selected, um, how was the fit performed, etc. Going back to the SIF format used to describe crystallographic data, if we look at what is actually described in the SIF file, there are similarly many metadata blocks about the material, so crystal sample, synthesis, experiment conditions. Um, then there's actual crystal data with unit cell parameters, atomic position, etc. But often in the SIF file, there's the entire data from the experiment, all the reflections measured, all the data treatments to obtain the final structure, refinement parameters, constraints applied, etc. So one can download the SIF file from the CCDC and redo the entire refinement to, for, for example, check some of the assumptions that were made. And this is, <clears throat> this is what I hope could uh, be uh, could serve for the uh, the AI format. When it comes to data processing, there are also many awesome initiatives from the community to standardize or to improve uh, how some data is obtained. I've compiled some of these awesome resources in the list, which you can find link here on GitHub. Um, feel free to submit a pull request or to suggest your awesome absorption package. Um, but here are just some of the uh, programs or resources that are highlighted there. Some programs which help with reproducible surface area calculations, um, multi-component predictions, simulation of breakthrough curves, and other some more completely unique codes for, more, for example, process design or uh, porosity determinations. So my hope is that going forward, the AI can serve as an easy to use file format that can be fed into some of the same data processing or simulation algorithms so that anybody can reproduce the results that are reported in the paper. And I was glad to hear that these points were also raised by some attendants uh, and panelists. I'd like to show an example of how this could potentially work. So a while ago, I put together some of the scripts that I was using for processing data as an open source Python package. It was well received and led to a number of discussions and direct contributions on best practices, et cetera. 
um, it has really become a collaborative effort with others from around the world. So this is where the package, the Python package is published. And more recently, these scripts were extended into a graphical user interface. This provides as much as possible of the functionality of the package. So with that in mind, I'd like to showcase a, a live demo of how AIF could be used to, to, to transfer from multiple of these programs using PyGaps. So if I close this presentation, minimize it, great. Um, Okay, so now you should see uh, a nice water isotherm uh, recorded uh, with some SMS instruments. So what we will do is we will export the data. This will be dependent on how each instrument manufacturer does it. In this case, is being done in the macros. So this will give us the the data from the, the instrument, from the experiment, in a standardized AI format. Great. So now we can open PyGaps, and as you see here, the, the open uh, the main interface, and we just take the AI file that was created, and we simply drag and drop it in the Isotherm Explorer. So here we see the isotherm that was just, just mentioned. Um, what we see is that the, the material the isotherm was recorded on is, is visible here. The, all the metadata is visible here in, uh, and highlighted, can be edited as well. So it can also be a way of editing your AIFs, not only to visualizing them. Um, if we go to the isotherm points, it highlights all the points of the isotherm in the absorption and the desorption branches. Again, this can be edited um, or deleted. Um, another thing to highlight is the isotherm viewing. So here we can uh, look at how the isotherm looks. We can, of course, um, drag it around, zoom in. We can put it as a log for log uh, for the pressure or for loading. Um, Going forward, if we look at these uh, these absorbates here and all the other metadata, so um, PyGaps integrates with some thermodynamic databases like NIST RefProp or CoolProp. So that means there are some more intelligent things that can be done to, for example, convert between different different bases of the isotherm. So at the moment, the isotherm is in partial pressure, but Considering water, if we look here at water, water is has a thermodynamic back end, then we can convert pressure units from relative to absolute. And now we have it in Pascal, or your your favorite pressure unit, um, which may or may not be Tor. Let's stick to ISO. Um, the same we can, can be done with loading units. It can be converted from a percentage, so gram per gram, um, into other kinds of, uh, of uh, loading units, so now it is from percentage to gram per gram. If the material uh, density and molar masses are available, it can be converted from a gravimetric to a volumetric basis, etc. Um, now, um, the other thing that PyGaps includes is different characterization methods. So, for example, with BT surface area, Langmuir surface area, etc. Um, if we just have a quick load of some example data, here are various isotherms that can be used. And then afterwards, if we look at some, uh, some nitrogen 77 on the silica, we can run a BT surface area analysis. Uh, all, the, all the checks are implemented. We see the model fits correctly. And the imp interestingly is here this save as metadata, which saves all the results uh, from the BT area calculation as a metadata in the AIF file, which can then afterwards be exported and purely saved as an, an AIF file that includes all the metadata on how the BT area was obtained, including the BT area. So this is why I was, why I was mentioning that the AIF is a really extensible format. And there are many more you know, functionalities like uh, how to model an isotherm, for example, fitting a particular model, 
in this case can be fitted on a, on a, on a BET model, we auto fit that, then we might not like the fit in the low pressure regime, we change a little bit to the, the C constant to better fit, and then we can save it as a separate isotherm that now is actually model isotherm. So this is a BT isotherm. And uh, there is also a way of saving this as an AIF file. Um, it's not an official way of representing model isotherms, but perhaps that could be something that could be uh, implemented in the future. So uh, with this very brief uh, overview of the capabilities of ICAPS, I will go back to presentation. manage to find the button. Okay, so to, to summarize, so to summarize, the AIF format supercharges and empowers the visualization, analysis, and absorption data. And what I'm hoping is that this will put in a step towards democratization and standardization of various processing methods. So when I, when I talk about standardization processing methods, I mean how to best obtain the BT, uh, the BT area, how to uh, obtain four size distributions, open source uh, DFT, NLDFT kernels um, that would allow uh, anybody to, to process data with reproducible, reproducible and applicable uh, methods. And I just wanted, also, I just exemplified how this could be, this could be implemented with PyGAPs but I'm really looking forward to other contributions from the community on how the AIF file could facilitate this standardization process. So finally, I'd like to, to thank um, you for your attention. I'd like to make a point to thank all contributors to PyGAPS um, and also thank the members of the lab where this code started at Madurell. Um, as well as SMS, who's graciously funding some of the development time on PyGaps. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Paul, for this uh, great overview. I think this is very impressive and a very nice uh, software, very uh, potent tool, basically, also to evaluate data. Are there any questions from the audience? If there are no questions. Maybe you can comment uh, at the moment also a bit on the resources that are required to install the software. Um, the software is available as just an installable package. So from from the from the link, uh, uh, it can be downloaded and just it's a double click and install it. Uh, everything is taken care of. It should work uh, on Windows and on Linux and uh, hopefully soon on Mac as well. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Are there any questions from the audience to this uh, presentation? I don't see questions in the chat at the moment. Otherwise, I would uh, direct them to you. If there are more questions coming later, then we uh, hand over to the last presentation of the applicants. Is that okay for you, Paul? Sure thing, yeah. Yeah, great then. Uh, the last speaker is uh, Darren Broom from Haydn Instruments, and he will talk about high pressure applications. Darren, you should be able to share your slides now, yeah? Can you see that? It's my slide yeah. now. Looks very good. Oh, hold on a moment. Uh, right, okay. So my name's Darren Broom. I work for Hyde Nysakema, and I'm going to talk a little bit about high pressure uh, gas adsorption data in the context of the AIF. So firstly, why are we interested in high pressure gas adsorption? Um, we've already heard a few examples um, today, but um, a lot of the interest is driven by applications, and that includes gas storage, uh, for example, the storage of hydrogen and methane um, for use as alternative energy carriers or fuels in, um, in cars and so forth. There's also a range of um, gas separations that can use adsorption. I've just included a few examples here, but there are more 
So we've got air separation, helium production, hydrogen purification and carbon dioxide capture. These involve the separations of various um, species from each other. Now, the important point is that most of these applications require isotherms at elevated pressures. Uh, gas storage um, requires pressures of, say, up to 100 bar. Um, a lot of gas separations operate at above ambient temperature too. So two of the common separation methods are pressure swing adsorption and temperature swing adsorption. I've got a schematic diagram over on the right hand side illustrating the working capacities in the two cases. So for pressure swing adsorption or PSA, we require the working capacity between the um, adsorption pressure and the desorption pressure of the process. Whereas with um, TSA or temperature swing adsorption, we require the working capacity between the adsorption temperature and the desorption temperature. Um, the pressure swing and temperature swing um, conditions are shown over on the right hand, right hand side here. Um, most of these applications, as I stated before, require um, adsorption isotherms at elevated pressures above ambient. This was touched upon um, earlier in the discussion, but a crucial point for high pressure gas adsorption is the difference between excess and absolute adsorption. I have an illustration over on the right hand side of the difference between these two quantities. And an equation on the left hand side here shows how the absolute adsorption is calculated from the excess using um, a, ga a real gas term or a gas term, sorry, VA rho G, where VA is the adsorbed um, phase volume and rho G is the gas density. Um, over on the right hand side, the plot shows the absolute adsorption, which is monotonic with pressure and excess, which reaches a peak and decreases with pressure. And then there's the gas phase term VA rho G increases as a function of pressure. Um, so at point A, um, which might be the equivalent to say nit measuring nitrogen adsorption at 77 Kelvin, the excess equals the absolute. Um, but by the time we've got to point D um, over here, um, the, excess, the absolute is far greater than the excess. So it's very important to distinguish between these two quantities um, in the high pressure gas adsorption case. Should also mention that there's an additional definition of um, adsorption, which is net adsorption. This was covered by um, Gummer and Talu back in um, 2010. And this describes adsorption with reference to an empty sample cell volume. And what this does is it removes the uncertainty um, in the, either the volume or the density of the sample from the calculation of the adsorbed quantity. And it's particularly useful in the case of adsorptive gas storage. Over on the right hand side, we have um, adsorption isotherms where we have um, for the same experimental data set, the um, top plot is absolute adsorption. Uh, the middle one is excess. And then the bottom one is the net adsorption. And the key point for gas storage is the point at which the net adsorption, net adsorbed quantity equals zero. Um, that defines the uh, maximum pr uh, the pressure at which there's no longer any benefit to having adsorbent in the storage tank. So you can see for this case, uh, which I believe is methane, we have a pressure of just over 200 bar at which the adsorbent is no longer serving a useful purpose. So why is the AIF important for high pressure gas adsorption? Well, reproducibility um, has been quite an issue in hydrogen storage material research. And over on the right hand side, I show the um, cover for an article I published um, with Michael Hersher um, back in 2021, covering um, ways of improving reproducibility in hydrogen storage material research. However, um, all high pressure gas absorption measurements are subject to error. There's been further work, like um, for example, a study by David Scholl and co-workers showing that um, high pressure CO2 absorption in MOFs um, includes quite a lot of um, likely irreproducible data. Now, sharing data in a standard format like the AIF, um, as well as providing sufficient experimental detail, um, is a key component to improving reproducibility, and that's where the AIF um, comes in. 
Um, it's important to note there are, though, unique aspects of high pressure absorption um, data that must be included, and that's net excess and absolute adsorption, as I've described in the previous two slides, um, and then also the use of fugacity as well as pressure that allows the real gas behaviour of, um, of, um, of most gases to be taken into account. And I'll just finish with um, some example screenshots from uh, high Isochema instrument software. Um, we have here a methane adsorption and desorption isotherm uh, measured up to a pressure of 50 bar, um, seen on the uh, on the x-axis. On the y-axis, we have excess adsorption. In the software, you right-click on the plot, and that brings up a file menu which includes the export data to AIF option. When you click on that, it produces the AIF um, shown on the right-hand side in Notepad. So this includes the um, experimental conditions um, that have been discussed throughout this workshop at the top. Um, but then here is the data, and it's important to note, firstly, um, the first column is pressure, the second column is fugacity, and then the third column is the excess adsorption. So this is this is the key point with the with the high pressure um, adsorption. You'll also note there's no saturation pressure uh, because, as Dan was um, discussing earlier, um, gases such as uh, methane at ambient um, temperature or near ambient temperature do not have a, a saturation pressure. Then in the software you can um, calculate absolute adsorption. Um, so there's a communication window here, which includes various details about the sample. But down in the right bottom right-hand corner, we have the absolute adsorption calculation. So you can use different um, assumptions um, for the volume of the adsorbed phase. Here we're using the constant density approximation. So we're assuming the adsorbed phase has a constant um, density. That density is entered. Um, you then click OK, and that plots the absolute adsorption. Note here that we're plotting this against fugacity on the x-axis, which actually goes up to a lower total value than the, than the pressure. On the y-axis, we also have absolute adsorption. So again, you right-click on the graph, bring up the file menu and export data to AIF, and that gives you the AIF file over on the right-hand side. Again, we have experimental information at the top, um, and then in the um, loop, we have the adsorption pressure, fugacity, and then in this case, the absolute adsorption. So that's a demonstration of um, generating an AIF directly from our instrument software. And with that, I'll summarize. So um, we require high pressure gas adsorption isotherms in order to assess um, different adsorbents for gas storage and separation applications, um, many of which require um, above atmospheric pressure um, data. The um, difference between net excess and absolute adsorption is very important um, for high pressure gas adsorption isotherms, and the AIF format is important um, in order to help improve the reproducibility of high pressure gas adsorption data um, which has been a particular problem in hydrogen storage material research, but is likely a, an issue elsewhere as well. And that helps by sharing, helping to share data and report experimental details. And finally, data can be easily outputted um, in an AIF format from the Hyde Nysakema instrument software using the export to AIF, AIF function. And with that, I'll um, thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you, Darren, for this uh, very clear, uh, excellent presentation. Uh, very uh, great to see this. Thank you very much. Okay, there's one question. Um, I've been performing high pressure monometric adsorptions and doing calculations in simple Excel. How can I obtain AIF file for my high pressure adsorption calculations in Excel? Okay, maybe this is a difficult question, but. <laughs> yeah, I'm not too sure I can give a. Um, good quick answer to that. Um, you can obviously construct it manually um, yourself, but in fact, I think this was brought up as a discussion point earlier, wasn't it? About um, from, was it David Donacci maybe who 
asked about producing one from an XY column. Yes, yes, that's true. Yeah, so that's, principle, yeah. it's possible to to generate this. Uh, um, I mean, I think one can also uh, write an own application basically to include the main terms basically. Um, the AIF file has a header which contains all the important terms regarding the sample preparation and so on. Um, so you can you can basically use that header, uh, the same one that is produced for another isotherm, and then you would basically produce the um, the lines by yourself with a, a small routine that you would have to then to. Um, yeah, I think you can even do this in Excel basically to generate such an output. That would be also possible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But maybe a, a challenge is, of course, I think in your software, it's quite nice that you can easily convert from one data set to another, from net to absolute and so on, access. And um, that's quite valuable. And um, um, But this software is only linked to your instruments, obviously, right? That, that's right, yes. So if we have a RuboTherm balance, we cannot use your, your software? Um, no, that's correct. Okay. So. <laughs> Great. Okay, then are there more questions? Uh, I don't see more questions at this point. I think we are also a bit late. So then let's come to the next presentation. Thank you very much, Darren, again, for this great presentation. My pleasure. Thank you. And then we come to Dan, who will give us an overview about the uh, database. Just a second, so you should be able to share your slides now. And if there are more questions for Darren, then I will forward them to to him. Yeah, we see your slides, but your micro is off, I think. There we are. Great. All right. Uh, thank you, Stefan, and all of the panelists for working together to put together this wonderful workshop today. Um, I'd like to just briefly comment on maybe the question that Darren addressed at the end about Excel um, and how to interact with AIF for tools perhaps you've written already. Uh, AIF files, if you just copy and paste into Excel, actually should actually work very well for separating into columns. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean it's set up for your analysis, but it, it get you, gets you 80% of the way there. Uh, and then on the other part of it, I would recommend that if, if people are interested in how to parse AIF files for analysis, uh, look at the codes that we've already released in the GitHub repository and use those uh, examples as, in a sense, it'll get you 95% of the way to learning how to parse the CIF file or the, the AIF file because it is in essentially the same as the CIF file. Uh, and then from there, you end up with a data dictionary that you can manipulate using Python or other tools that you have access to. So use those as examples. Uh, they're very, very helpful. Uh, so what I want to talk about today is uh, NIST data resources for adsorption, uh, especially our isotherm database, and then also uh, how it relates to AIF. And so I, I want to talk a little bit about NIST, uh, existing data resources, how AIF and our existing JSON standard uh, will interact, how AIF will affect the future of NIST adsorption data, and then wrap up. Um, so if I event, identify any commercial items uh, in this presentation, uh, please do not uh, assume that it implies a recommendation by NIST or that it is the best uh, use for, for the purpose described. Uh, of course, I should always acknowledge the people that have worked on these projects over, over the years. Uh, we've had a number of NIST and internal collaborators, especially the programmer Alberto Marengo, who wrote much of the code that, that runs the NIST Isotherm database. Uh, the, students that have contributed to gathering data uh, and also funding that originated with the RPE agency uh, back in 2014. Uh, and then some of the more recent work was done in collaboration with uh, two postdocs from Baron Smith's group at EPFL, uh, Daniel Ongari and Leah Pugteliers, who have both moved on uh, to, uh, to new, new uh, pursuits. NIST, as many of you know, is the National Metrology Institute of the United States. Uh, responsible for maintaining the SI system for the United States. We also maintain the National U.S. Reference Data System, of which NIST Isotherm Database is a part of. Uh, you may know NIST from 
our standard reference materials or certified reference materials that are available or through reference data products, such as the chemistry webbook, RefProp that was mentioned by Paul or the Thermodata engine. Uh, and more recently, NIST has been the host for the facility for adsorbent characterization and testing, uh, our metrology and measurement uh, laboratory for adsorption. And so, for, for example, uh, the FACT lab is now the main access point for, for obtaining reference materials related to adsorption and the uh, the interlaborate and has been the kind of con convening group for the interlaboratory studies that have led to reference isotherms. Uh, in particular, I'd point out the three uh, zeolites that are available as reference materials from NIST, RM 8850, 51, and 52, and then some interlaboratory studies that have been done in, in concert with other groups outside of the U.S., such as the reference isotherm for CO2 on ammonium ZSM5, uh, the methane isotherm on zeolite Y, and I'm very excited to report that the reference isotherm for water absorption on a nano, nanoporous carbon uh, was finished and was published just last week. Uh, so if you go to the uh, journal absorption, uh, you can find it in the ASAP articles section. Uh, that reference isotherm was done on BAM-P109, that's a nanoporous carbon uh, that is distributed by uh, the German Metrology Institute as a CRN. Right. NIST fits into a worldwide uh, network of metrology laboratories. Uh, one thing I can recommend to all of the, the people listening, especially students, is that get to know the metrology resources that are available to you uh, through your country and the way that you then interact with regional metrology organizations and then ultimately the BIPM. Uh, there, there are a great number of resources for describing data and for describing uncertainty in data that are maintained through these networks of metrology institutes. Uh, and so just see them as a resource um, there's a there's a publication in the United States that jokingly called NIST the most important government agency you've never heard of. I would apply that same type of of, of tourism to the metrology institutes in your own countries. Is they're very very important for the foundation of science in your country, and view it as a resource that that, that will aid and help your work. So let's move into NIST data resources for adsorption science and technology. Uh, the the data platform. Uh, shown in the URL link in the upper right, adsorption.nist.gov is kind of the landing place for all of the data resources for adsorption that NIST uh, works on. Uh, this is the data in the informatics complement to the NIST fact lab, such as in, in isotherm measurements, material characteristics, and an entire ecosystem of tools, analytics, and an API for accessing that data. Uh, the data sources, and I'm going to describe this on another slide in more detail, um, our, our main goal is to which is to distribute the measurements from the fact lab. But as a, then as a complement to this, we also compile uh, data, adsorption data from the extant scientific literature. Uh, as of last weekend, we had 4,300 papers, 37 or th almost 38,000 isotherms of which nearly 3,000 are multi-component covering 450 adsorbates and more than 8,000 adsorbent materials. We plan to include about 200 additional papers per year anywhere between 1,000 and 2,000 isotherms uh, per year. And our present focus is on multi-component isotherms and liquid phase adsorption. So let's go into a quick review and a, some, some options for how to use ISODB. Uh, so if you go to adsorption.nist.gov, you're first presented with this landing page, which gives you access to uh, two of our data resources and the fact lab. And so if you go to ISODB, that will give you access to the search platform for the isotherm database. This data is, this this uh, Database is built around identifying articles and then connecting them with isotherms. So if you search for a, a material, this is an autofill feature. I'm going to look up the NIST reference material, 8852, and then identify articles that are associated with that material. If I go and then access an article, it will then show me the metadata associated with that article that's been compiled, as well as present a list of isotherms from that from from that uh, from that article, uh, we can plot multiple isotherms in the data widget uh, or data plotting widget as long as the units are compatible, and so you can do quick comparisons of of isotherms from individual papers this way. Additionally, you can access the isotherms in a text in a text format, and this is being served by the API functions of the isotherm database. The data sources for the NIST isotherm database uh, are 
are always reviewed disclosures of isotherm data. And that can be journal articles or technical reports or internal NIST documents. And I'll just point out that when NIST does an internal document, we have our inter own internal review board that, that reviews the data and the article for accuracy. Um, we always associate data in, our, in, a, in the isotherm database with a DOI. Uh, that is, in a sense, the unique identifier that connects it back to the literature. Um, and really, this is a this is a purpose a purposeful speed bump or a gate a gate on the data that gets into the isotherm database. If you don't have a DOI, it won't make it in. It just doesn't work otherwise. We have an annual summer project where U.S. high school students spend eight to ten weeks converting isotherms from literature articles into digital data that then gets uploaded into the isotherm database. We audit around 10% of the entries, and, and as was pointed out, there are mistakes that get made, and if and those are, mistakes are reported to us, we go back in and correct them. Um, the isotherm data that is in the ISODB is, however, incomplete in comparison to what may be available from the, the information off from a, um, an isotherm from an, from an instrument. Um, Paul very nicely showed that when you had access to the material density and other aspects of material characteristics, you can then convert the, the isotherm into absolute or back to excess. You can do unit conversions. You can change from um, like a millimole per gram unit to gram per gram, or you can convert over to different units. Um, we are limited based on what is in the articles, and so we and also what our database is able to contain. We just we can't contain all of the material data that's really necessary for those conversions, and so it's the responsibility of the user to go back to the literature and try to find the missing information to do the, the conversions that they're interested in. We always check supplementary information for papers, and then we cross-reference that against isotherms in the main document. And so the idea here is that we capture all of the data that has been provided by the authors. Uh, and also, if there's a figure in the main paper, but then there's the tabular data and the supplementary information, we would use the tabular data rather than the graphic. The articles that we look for each year are selected based on programmatic prior priorities. In the early years of the isotherm database, we had a focus on single adsorbate adsorption. And the idea there was to just get a quantity of lots of isotherms quickly so that we built up the database to be something useful. Uh, starting in 2018, we started adding multi-component data. Um, for three years, we had an intense focus on liquid phase adsorption. Uh, we're still continuing that, but at, at a lower uh, lower preference. Uh, and then starting in 2021, uh, we began including data for curated data sets. Uh, for example, the curated COFs set of materials that's maintained by Baron Smith's group. Um, and also then reference materials from both NIST and other metrology institutes worldwide. One problem that we encountered while developing the NIST isotherm database was the, the issue of how do we uniquely identify an adsorbent material. Um, the INCHI system is not really suitable to adsorbent materials. SMILES can be used if you have the, the right manipulation tools like the MOF ID or the MOF key method developed by Ben Bussiar in Sinners group. Uh, CAS and IEPAC identifiers are of limited use, um, but you run into a lot of other pitfalls too while, while trying to use uh, unique identifiers for observed materials. Uh, first being that uh, some materials just flat out don't fit into an ambiguous definition, like if you have a porous carbon. Uh, if you just call it a porous carbon, what does that really mean? Because it has to do with where the material is originally sourced, how it was turned into an activated material, how it was, how it was milled or prepared. Material history matters uh, because an isotherm is not really just a, a function of temperature and the adsorbate and the material. Um, you have to know about how the material is treated between synthesis and then ultimately experimental characterization. Composite materials present another problem because that is really outside of the scope of, of INCHI or IUPAC naming, naming schemes. Um, there's that preparation issue, which is part of material history. There's inconsistent naming schemes. Uh, so for example, uh, the copper BTC material that I'm showing over here um, was originally called HCUST1. Um, copper BTC seems to be the more popular name. If you buy this from BASF, they call it Basolite C300. And so a lot of my collaborators at NIST just call it C300 all the time. And then years later, I discovered that it was also called, called, uh, called MOF199. Uh, the last issue that you can run into is that sometimes materials are just identified by synthesis. And so you have a paper where they have a material called Compound1. Well, that's a little bit difficult to work with <laughs> for, for putting this into standardized databases. So the solution that we have come up with for trying to address this problem is the NIST registry of, of adsorbent materials. Uh, basically, our, our registry uh, uses an, a unique identifier that we call a hash key, which is generated from a cryptographic uh, hashing system that is then associated with different names, 
chemistry if possible, relevant articles such as synthesis or characterization, and then external resources if they're available for those materials. Uh, so if we go into NIST ISO DB, uh, into the MATDB for just a moment, let's load that up. You can search for a material and see how it has been cross-referenced against all of these other resources. And so Copper BTC, for example, we have our internal registry ID based on a, on a cryptographic hash. It's been associated with synonym names um, and then also with external resources that, that are linked out. Um, it can also be used for more novel materials. And so one material that's been looked at very closely at NIST recently is aluminum formate. Um, so we created a we we created this with with the cooperation of the NIST scientists that were characterizing the material, and then we link out to relevant papers uh, for this article, for example. And so uh, the activation procedure turned out to be rather unique for this material. Excuse me, the proxy on my end is causing some problems right now. There we are. So this paper that just came out uh, last fall in Science. Uh, from a group at NIST describes this material, and we've linked to that directly through the registry that NIST provides. All right. So that's the MATDB, and we've gone through that. Uh, if you would like to submit data to the MATDB, there's a user feedback form where you can say, propose a material for entry in the registry. Um, it will try to fill this based on what you were accessing recently, uh, but, but you can fill out this form to propose a material to be added to the registry, and then it gets sent to my inbox, and then I do a, a technical review, and then if it's acceptable, it will be put into the into the material registry, and then is useful uh, and, and usable by outside scientists. All right, let's talk a little bit about the NIST JSON isotherm format, which was a pre-existing uh, uh, pseudo standard for isotherms before AIF went in, into development. The, the idea behind the JSON isotherm format is to kind of capture the, enough details about the isotherm data and the process uh, in, a, in a way that is machine readable. And so really what we're trying to do here is capture the thermodynamics of, of what's going on in, in the experiment. We have to know things about the bulk gas, such as the adsorptive species, the pressure, the composition, temperature. Um, the adsorbed phase has to be described as well in terms of the adsorbent material, possibly the amount, the adsorbed masses of, of the of the adsorbates, and then the information that kind of connects these two phases together in terms of the chemical and mechanical equilibrium. And so if you think about the isotherms that are, say, shown in this graphic on the left, it's an O2 into multi-component isotherm on a, on a mordinate material. Um, this table shows, in a sense, is a capturing all of the all of the information about this isotherm. There's a lot of information here. There's the data from the from the from the graphic itself. You have the material, you have the temperature, but there's also things like the units, pressure is in terms of bar, where the, the gas phase is described in terms of a mole fraction, adsorption is given in millimoles per gram. All of this information is relevant to digitizing this isotherm. And so the isotherm standard that we developed at NIST was the, the JSON file, uh, which is a key value dictionary uh, using the JavaScript object notation structure, where basically we have keys that are captured in and encapsulated in quotations, and then there's a value associated with those keys. Uh, so this is where like the hash key becomes useful because we can link the hash key with the adsorbent material. We can also include a name, like in this case, the mordenite material. The adsorbates are listed and we're using inchi key as the identifier uh, along with the name, uh, but inchi key is the, is, the, is the primary standard for this. Uh, we describe what kind of measurement is done in terms of a category, the temperature is, is included. Uh, we describe whether this has been taken from tabular data or is, and the fallback is that it's from the graphical data. We have to have the metadata about the units. And then we have the structure of the isotherm data. And this looks complicated, but it's really just a, a, a JSON encoding of tabular data. So for each line in, say, this data table, we had to have pressure, we had to have mole fractions and adsorption, and we're capturing that through these, J, through these JSON objects that include the, uh, the, the pressure and then the species data and the, and the, and the adsorption. So you can plot it then uh, from, from the JSON file. And so what I wanna show now is actually how you can maybe get go from this data table over to JSON and then ultimately over to AIF. And this really addresses that early question about what if I have CSV data? How can I convert this in, into something usable 
or get it all the way to, to AIF. And what I'm going to show today is not a publicly available tool. Um, a publicly available tool that was developed with us, with, with the aid of Baron Smith's group at APFL, um, is online, but I cannot access it from NIST because the certificate has expired over the weekend. <laughs> so I'll, I'll put the link online later on, uh, but you have to access that on your own. So let's go over and actually use a digitization, a digitization platform to generate JSON output. And so the way that we do this at NIST is that uh, we have a digitization platform. Let's reset this and start it up again. So if um, the, the idea here is that it's not enough to just have CSV data. You have to have some sort of description. You need to have some way to put this into an encoded format. And so the way that we've done this at NIST is we've developed an application where we can paste data in uh, to create the JSON output. And so I'm going to kind of pre-populate this form to save a little bit of time. And then let's do a couple of modifications here. So let's put that Mordenite material in. And data for the Mordenite material looking at the data table here is, is nitrogen and oxygen at 273. Kevin, so let's fill that in. We need to input our gases. Fill out some information about what the data is, where our units are bars and millimoles per gram. Let's delete the data that was automatically pasted and then fill in the data. Now, um, going back to David's question early on, um, the, the CSV data would have to be structured very particularly to be able to be used in this system. And so, like, we have a very particular rule that this, like, our form has to follow here. And so, the students that I that I, I, I employ summer to fill this out. And do the and do this digitization work have to learn exactly how to structure this data to be to be dropped in. Uh, so once we filled out the form, we basically have filled in all of the metadata fields that are necessary for describing the isotherm. And then our system, you submit the data, and it first gives you an, op an opportunity to review and make sure that it looks correct. And if it does, you say, okay, looks good, and you can view the results. So here. All it's just showing is the JSON encoded isotherm that's been put together. So that's our platform, our system for digitizing isotherms. Um, a a midterm goal is potentially to have this digitization application online for general use, um, and then the idea would be that outside uh, scientists could use this form to generate, say, a JSON file, and perhaps there would be a new button on the side here that would submit directly to AIF, and then you could download your file and it can be submitted to NIST for the isotherm or just simply used in your own paper. But the, the next thing we have to do though is of course convert this to AIF. And so we actually have tools built in the GitHub repository already. And so if you were to go to the, uh, the repository for, for AIF, if you clone the, the repository, you'd have access to the parsing tools that have already been developed. And one of those is the NIST JSON parser, which is already importable once you have downloaded this from, from GitHub. And so if, if you go into like, I just use, I use Jupyter. And so you can see that what I've done here is I've imported the NIST JSON features of AIF. And then once I have a JSON file from say the NIST isotherm database, I can look at that JSON file and I can also convert it directly over to AIF. And so. This is all just, I mean, this is very few lines of code, but it takes you directly from a JSON file over to AIF easily without any problem whatsoever. Uh, it's also very easy to go back to JSON if needed. Um, so this happens to be a, a, an AIF file that was provided by a group at Imperial College uh, for a paper for a, for a journal a special issue last year. If you look at their AIF file, this is, a, this is uh, formatted based on the AIF standard as of last, uh, last summer. We have this AIF file, and then we also use other tools that are part of the NIST JSON package or of parsers from the GitHub repository. You can convert back to JSON very easily. Um, so you have this back and forth compatibility already built into the, to the GitHub repository. All right, so let's address some of the questions here. So we have, in a sense, two different standards for presenting isotherm data, the, the JSON format and the AIF format. Uh, both formats are key value dictionaries. They contain essentially the same information content and quality. The GitHub repository actually already includes a, a 
and this is a transcription database, uh, transcription dictionary. And so some of the keys that we have defined in AAF differ from what has been used in JSON. And the conversions for that are already part of the software on GitHub. So I, I would not say this absolutely, but for the most part, you can switch between JSON and AIF without losing any information at all. The only time that there would be information loss is if there's a field that NIST JSON doesn't understand or if AIF doesn't understand. So if you went from JSON to AIF, you might lose a little bit of information if there's a field that's not understood by the by the by the alternate standard. And then if you went back to JSON, then you would lose it by going back again. Um, but I think that those are very much edge cases. Uh, for the most part, there should be no data loss at all going back and forth between JSON and AIF. Uh, the other question is, is there really a competition between these two? And my argument is that there's not. NIST JSON and AIF are complementary standards, and, but they also serve different intentions. JSON is a simpler interface to inter existing data processing tools because it's more generic and not specific. That's great from a software standpoint because anybody can load the JSON package in Python and then interact with JSON isotherms. AIF, on the other hand, is designed by adsorption scientists. It has domain specificity. And so it is, I think, better for encoding the data that you want to communicate to other adsorption scientists. On the other hand, JSON is simple to use. And so I think there's always going to be an interaction between the two of them. I think a lot of people will probably get AIF files from authors. It'll be unambiguous about what the fields mean, and they'll probably convert it over to JSON for use in data processing tools. Um, from a practical point of view, AIF has a big advantage in that you can paste it into spreadsheet software directly. Uh, so I, I, I do this already uh, sometimes when I need to process data. I'll just grab the AIF and I just drop it right into Excel, and then I can do data manipulations on the fly. Now, how does AIF relate to the NIST isotherm database in the future? Okay. When, we're when we're looking at how we're going to put data into the NIST isotherm database, digital data is already the priority for us. Plotted isotherms are necessary, but not preferred. That said, the majority of our data is still coming from plotted isotherms at this point, because tabular data just is still only maybe 10% of, of the data max out there. Tables are okay. Data files are even better. AIF or NIST JSON is absolutely the best way. And even as of this year, AIF is the preferred data source for NIST ISODB. Um, the way that I kind of solve this problem right now is that I look for the, the article that Jack and, and Stefan and collaborators at TU Dresden uh, published in 2021 in Langmuir. If, and any articles that cite it, we look to see if they have isotherm data, and then we, we grab that data first. So it's basically first in line. Um, but the long-term plan is that AIF will be the only data source for NIST ISODB. And so at some point when we have enough kind of community take up of AIF, the only way to get into our database will be to publish your, your, your isotherms in AIF. Okay, some tips for authors. Um, so include your isotherm data in, a, in some sort of tabular form as supp in supplementary information. Okay, AIF and JSON are of course the best. Um, the idea here is to simplify the data context and facilitate interpretation. That's what AIF does for you, is it facilitates the interpretation because the structure has been designed by domain experts. So beyond that, it's also helpful to provide a complete description of the measurement. Okay? Provide the full context of the gas or mobile phase. That means including information about carrier gases, composition. State whether the isotherm is excess or absolute. Okay? After looking at a lot of isotherms over 10 years, I have a pretty good instinct for figuring out if an isotherm is excess or absolute, but most authors don't say, st state what kind of isotherm they're actually presenting. Um, as we pointed out earlier on, um, define the meaning of P0 if that's used in a graph. State out right that it's a, that it's a saturation pressure. I also recommend that authors always include a clear description of the absorbent material and use a material identifier if possible. Link it to a CCDC deposit number or cast number, smiles, whatever you can. And if those are not available, put an entry in NIST material registry and then link back to that hash key. We will maintain that for you going on in the future. Beyond that, also use existing standardized data or metadata frameworks. We use Inchi through Inchi key and Inchi code in the NIST database, but consider using a unit schema that is computer readable. QUDT is emerging as the, as the main standard for presenting uh, units. Uh, so get to, get to know that. 
it'll be very helpful for your work in the future and it will avoid uh, confusion about what your units mean in the future. With that, I would also recommend that you, in, kind of building on what I said earlier about metrology, is get to know best uh, guides for best, pra best practices for, for presenting data. Um, a lot of units that are used in, in, in papers are actually not recommended. Uh, the one that pops up a lot is weight percent. Uh, weight percent is actually not recommended by BIPM uh, as a unit uh, to use because it is ambiguous. Uh, there's no way to clearly know what weight percent actually means. Uh, so it's better to use uh, unambiguous units uh, uh, per recommendations by, by institutions like BIPM or your, your domestic metrology institute. So how do you get your isotherms to NIST isotherm database? Okay. Remember, data are always centered around a publication. It has to have a DOI, peer reviewed is required, peer review is required first. Now, this process of getting data to us can be coordinated with your pub publisher. If you contact me while you're writing a paper, I'll help you get things formatted, whether it's AIF or JSON, and then those data files can be with me waiting for your paper to be published. And as soon as your paper is released, then we can hit, we can get it uploaded and put it in this isotherm database and released to the to the public. Um, if you do that, you can also cite your data in place. Okay, we have this kind of a widget built into isotherm database where if you uh, if you include the the DOI in this particular uh, function call, this is like a REST API function, uh, you can then link directly to the data entries for your paper uh, without having to like uh, have someone search for it. You can just provide a URL. Okay, now a couple of other wrap-up comments. Um, if you're interested in seeing how AIF can be used for publications, uh, go take a look at the special issue of Journal of Chemical and Engineering Data that was published uh, in July of last year. Um, this issue was devoted to equilibrium and adsorption data, and we worked with the authors to submit data as AIF files, um, and the AIF development team assisted in checking and formatting the data. Um, the one caveat I will say is that this special issue used an early AIS specification, and a lot of the key values and, and uh, data key names have been revised since that since that article came out. Uh, but that gets back at that question about um, what about things when things change. Use the the audit key in your AIF file to link your AIF back to a standard or to a particular instance of the standard. Then you can go back. People can go back and see what was meant by your AIF file based on the specification as it existed at that point in time. Um, for additional resources, I'd like to point you to our GitHub repository for NIST adsorption data, uh, github.com forward slash NIST ISODB. Um, that, is, that has a variety of tools. Uh, it also includes that AIF instruction document that Jack referred to in his presentation at the very beginning of the workshop. Um, I'll just point out that the AIF instructions there were written for the, the JCED special issue, and so they are currently based on an earlier version of AIF. Uh, it's going to be updated soon uh, to reflect the newer uh, data key uh, names for AIF. Now, if you have a web browser and you want to go check this out, you can go look at a digitization platform um, called on the mattscreen.com um, website. This is maintained by Baron Smith's group. Um, this currently has a way of depositing and filling out the form to, to create a JSON file. The intention is to have a direct AIF output for this uh, tool in the future, um, the, but I would just ask you to be patient. Uh, the certificate is out of date. I just only, that only happened over the weekend, and also the software uh, needs a revision for Python 3.10. Uh, there, there were some issues related to uh, exception handling that popped up recently that we haven't had a chance to fix yet. I'd like to point out one last thing, and this kind of builds on some of the questions about simulation data and how we can link AIF to other resources. And so one of the things that our group at NIST uh, maintains is the NIST standard simulation reference website. This is in a sense a, a source of data for, um, for molecular simulations that have been described in a great amount of detail. Uh, range, it's primarily for, or for bulk fluids. So we've run the simulations and, and then tabulated the data and results. For a variety of model fluids, but we also have reference adsorption isotherms uh, computed from molecular simulations online. Uh, so what we released last year were CO2 reference isotherms in a, in a handful of metal organic frameworks. Uh, we've described in what I think is an excruciating amount of detail the basis of the simulations and how we how we ran them, the 
a lot of the, the even like the move sets that are used in the GCMC, um, how we used configurational bias. The materials and the force fields are available uh, for download. Uh, and then we then we provided the isotherm results for these simulations. But one thing that we did in addition was that the data associated with these isotherms is, is available in AIF format. And so the GitHub repository that's associated with this data um, has the AIF files directly. And so if we open up, say, the AIF file for, this is a CO2 adsor adsorption in copper BTC at 300 Kelvin, we'll take a look at this data. We have the standard metadata header for AIF, but then we also have the full isotherm data. And you'll notice here that there's some additional fields that, that we've added that maybe have been referred to throughout the day. Uh, we have the adsorption amount, but we also have the uncertainty based on an uncertainty um, estimation. We included the isosteric heat and the uncertainty in that isosteric heat from these simulations. Uh, and based on some, some input from the JCED uh, editors, we also included fugacity uh, because that's relevant for these molecular simulations. We didn't simulate this at constant pressure, we simulated it at constant chemical potential or constant fugacity. And so that's a relevant quantity then uh, for this. In addition, we also had to include the, the, the kind of supporting data for this. And so if I go into the supporting data for the simulation, we have the raw simulation output in a CSV form in a CSV format, but we have metadata that describes the isotherm as well. And so this is a kind of a minified form of the table describing the simulation, but then we have the temperature data, the cell data, uh, and even information about the Ewald uh, the Ewald uh, potential that was used um, in addition to the units description. And these are all encoded using the QUDT format. Uh, so I just wanted to show this as an example of how AIF can be linked back to, in this case, simulation data. And perhaps this is an example for how it can be used uh, for linking back to characterization data for materials that are done in, in a laboratory setting. And with that, I'd like to take any questions and uh, just hope that you can see how AIF is going to be kind of a big part of the NIST adsorption data ecosystem and how I think there are all of these different tools that work together uh, and are going to interact and, and benefit from, from, uh, from use together. Yeah, thank you, Dan, for this uh, wonderful presentation, a very impressive overview about all the potential possibilities with the database. And uh, I must say, I'm really highly impressed about the commitment that you put into this, uh, all these efforts. And um, I think this is really a, a great development towards improving the quality of uh, uh, published adsorption data and, and also the, the processing. So we are close to the end, but um, we still have time for a few questions from the audience. Um, are there any questions at the moment? I don't see a question coming up uh, directly. Ah, there is one question, not specific, but I was wondering if and how we can obtain a certificate of attendance for this workshop. Ah, okay. Sorry, this is not specific to this workshop. Okay. Um, yeah, maybe I have to think about this. So um, normally uh, we, we don't do this, but if, if you require this, then I can also uh, give this via my secretary, of course. Yeah. Thank you for this question. Are there any specific questions to the NIST database? Maybe one question from my side. Um, I know that you imported already uh, quite a number of data um, years ago. And um, do you also intend to revise them if uh, better data are coming in so that there is sort of a um, improvement of the data after some time? I mean, it's already yes. excellent data, but I mean, there could be more uh, better data coming in. Yeah, so we, yes, we've been going back in and doing uh, spot revisions. Um, so we, we periodically, I, so part of the now the new workflow for the students that work for me during the summer is to go back and re, kind of revisit data that was digitized even 10 years ago and looking for opportunities to improve those data sets. Um, once we have a better idea of material metadata that can be included with isotherms that maybe like we're learning a lot from AIF so we can see what additional data fields to contain. Um, we will probably go back and try to do some revisions and adding that in. The problem, this is a good problem, is that we have 37,000 isotherms already to work with. And so it'll take a long time to do a, a comprehensive rebuild on that. What, what I think will be a, a an interim solution is that we are going to build in a sense subsets of data within isotherm database. 
So if you're interested in only tabular data, then you'll be able to search specifically for that. And it's, it's kind of like how in the CCDC, you can ask for the MOF subset. Uh, it's, it's the same idea in principle. Um, then, or perhaps requesting only ILS data um, or data that was only from AIF. So we'll tag our data in a, in a, in a more information rich way so that then you can limit your search to those specific subsets. Mm -hmm. Then there's one question. Are there any software available for material screening using JSON AIF format? So I think this refers probably to property screening. Um, so I've written a handful of tools. Um, so we have a column simulator where it's a very, very simplified, um, like a break breakthrough column simulator where you can read a JSON or uh, well, you have to read multiple JSON files to do a separation. Then you can model a breakthrough, um, but you have to know information about like the porosity and the material density. You have to submit, you have to put in a velocity for the gas. It's things that aren't associated with the isotherm. Um, and mm -hmm. then the plugin, so Paul, re Paul mentioned the, uh, the Betsy uh, BET modeling that was done. And you can interface directly to JSON files with Betsy uh, if, if that's if your data is set up that way. And so there's not a direct way to go from AIF to Betsy yet, but if you just do one little hop through JSON to get there, then you have the interface directly, indir mm -hmm. indirectly. Mm -hmm. uh, then there's one question. I, th I think this is also uh, a very general question. AIF is uh, just useful for MOF or also some specific material in your data. Uh, not for all adsorbent published. Um, I think maybe this uh, participant came in a bit later. Of course, the AIF format and uh, is, is for all adsorbents. It does not have to be crystalline. It's for all kinds of adsorbents, and you can use it for all your your isotherms. Yeah, absolutely correct. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, maybe one more question. While saving an AIF file from RAW to AIF software, why the file is being downloaded in AIF audio format? How to change the <laughs> format of this downloaded file? I, I, can actually, I can answer this question, is that we have an unfortunate collision here. Uh, Macintosh uses .AIF as the audio information format for Macintosh. And that, yes, that is an unfortunate collision on this. In fact, it confused the publishers. Um, they thought we were submitting uh, uh, a non or a binary format, um, and they were very concerned at first. That, that's yeah. that's a problem. That's the text extension. Um, of course, you can also change the extension. No problem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, great. Then I think we are at the end. And thank you very much, Dan. Then I would like to ask all. Uh, presenters again to um, to open their cameras if they are still uh, there then I will uh, do the closing session basically I would like to thank you all for your great uh, contributions I know today this was a lot of information for all the participants we had overall more than 500 reg registration uh, I think in the end more than 400, 400 people um, also attended the seminar for different amounts of time and um, we had a very good attention and I know it was a lot of information. I hope it was interesting for you and of course it was very important for us. We got uh, a lot of important feedback also in order to improve the, the standards that we are developing at the IUPAC task group. So therefore I'm quite thankful for all, uh, to all participants also, to all speakers for their great uh, contributions. <clears throat> I'm also um, very thankful uh, to the UPAC, IUPAC for supporting this uh, project. And um, of course, as an information, we recorded the whole meeting today and uh, we will put the recording online on YouTube and also um, advertise it again via the IIS, the International Adsorption Society and, and other links. So you can uh, recover the information and, and of course you can also always contact me or other people if, if uh, you have more important input or you want to directly connect to the, to, to the AIF group. So with this, a big thank you to all of you. Uh, I hope it was enjoyable and useful for you. Uh, thanks to all of you and I wish you a, a great day. And with this, I will stop the recording. I think that's the first thing that I